634. Uh, and with the indulgence of the committee, uh, I'd like to call over and do approve the minutes of November 20th, 2018. Afterwards, what I'd like to do is for, um, out, of, out of respect and kindness to some of those assembled, I'd like to move item 6A, MSAN student presentation, up to immediately following the minutes. Seeing no objection, so word. Uh, so the minutes are November 20th, 2018. I've got a chance to look at the minutes. I'd entertain a motion to approve. A move to accept the minutes of uh, November 20th. Okay. So moved and seconded. Is there any further comment? Okay. Yes. Quick clarification. Yes. Um, under E, the approval of the designer um, for the building study. Um, I think what I was trying to convey was that Steffi and Bradley were local, and that JCJ had had a had worked here before, but they weren't actually local. So I just we did sort of okay. That. So because they're not actually. Local. Oh. Thank you. Great. Can you have that? Yes, I do. Thank you. Great. Are there any further edits? Seeing none, I'd like to move this to a vote. All those in favor of approving the minutes of November 20, 2018, signify by raising your hand. Aye. Okay. Any nays? Any abstentions? One abstention. So that carries one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven, zero, one. Uh, thank you very much. And now, would you like any introduction? Sure. I'll do a brief introduction. So um, thanks to the committee for uh, having the MSAN student presentation tonight. And thanks also to let the students go first, because they've got many other things to do, I imagine, when they leave us after their role. Um, and I really just want to introduce Ms. Custard, our uh, interim assistant principal at the high school, who for many years has uh, led the MSAN, the, the students at the MSAN conference. This year was, as you'll hear, was local. So we didn't have to get on planes, which was uh, a nice thing. And it was, uh, but really just has led not just the students for the conference, but really been a fantastic leader for students across the high school more generally. And I think this is just way that, this is one way that manifests is the work for the MSAN students. So I'll turn it over to Ms. Custard if you want to do a bit of an introduction for the students. Um, they can introduce themselves. They're all student leaders and scholars, <laughs> um, even though they're trying to play shy now. <laughs> they can introduce themselves. I just want to say that I'm very happy that our district is a part of the MSAN network um, because we uh, continue to do the work on closing the achievement gap. Um, and it is a struggle. It's something that we need to do district-wide and not just at the high school because once they're in high school, there are some lessons that were not learned in lower grades. So. These students are all working really hard to achieve at high levels, and sometimes they stumble, but they pick themselves back up and, and they get their work done. And going to MSAN for three days really made them do that because they missed three days of school, um, but for the benefit of themselves and for our district. So I want to thank them for participating, and I will let you hear from them. Wonderful. And, I, and uh, I let Ms. Custard speak without a microphone, but I'm apologizing for everyone else. If you can, please approach the microphone when you, uh, when you speak. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hi. Hi. So um, my name is Mohammed Abdul Maksud. Uh, I'm a sophomore. And yeah, I'm part of MSAN. And uh, I'm the, one of the vice presidents of POKU. Um, I'm Tabor Bowman. I'm a 11th grader, and I'm also part of MSAN and POKU. I'm Pierre Tillis. I'm a junior, and like they said, part of MSAN and POKU. Yes. I have a question. What does MSAN stand for? Minority Student Achievement Network. Do you want to know what POKU stands for? Yes. <laughs> Hello, my name is Taylor Pope. I'm a junior at Emerson Junior High School. Uh, I'm one of the co-presidents for POKU, and I also play basketball for the high school. Could you actually 
help her uh, or bless what the committee Poku? out, I should what say. What is Poku? Poku, uh, People of Color United. Thank you. Yeah. I'm Aisha Proctor. I'm an 11th grader here at Amherst, and I'm a part of MSAN and POKU as well. Hi, um, I'm Yasin Norris Fall. I'm a senior. Um, I'm part of MSAN and POKU, and I was also captain of the volleyball team. Hi, my name is Khaleesi, and I'm a junior also, and I'm also part of POKU and MSAN. And I play soccer and lacrosse for high school. I'm Isabella Shepard. I am also an 11th grader. I'm part of POKU and MSAN and the new restorative justice leaders group. Sure. So I think one thing that, uh, thank you for being here, and one thing that I think would be helpful for the committee to hear is uh, I've heard some from the teachers and adults that have been connected to your work about the action plan that you developed at the end of the conference, some of the goals that you have for your work after the conference for the rest of the school year. So um, in speaking with other students and um, having conversations at the conference, something that was brought up was mental health and especially the African American community. And we talked about how it's often dismissed and there's not a lot of representation for people who work in mental health and who are also people of color. So our main idea here is to kind of bring that to the school and offer representation and people that, um, children of color in the school who have questions about mental health, who are experiencing issues with them, we want to give them uh, people that they can look up to and uh, models that they can look after, people who know about this thing and experts. And so our idea is to research um, mental health specialists in our area and we're mainly looking for people of color that we can bring to the school and have a panel so that we can have um, questions that students have and we can have these uh, specialists offer their insight and their experiences with the work that they do. So we can really just bring this idea forth and present because we feel like it's, it's not out there enough and we need more representation in our community. Yeah, thank, thank you. I think um, I turn it over to the committee to see if you have questions. Um, but I really appreciate hearing it from you. I heard it from a number of the adults and discussed it. And Ms. Dr. Gramacki, um, and I just appreciate the lens that you're bringing to both the school but also to the larger community. Um, but I, I would turn it over to the committee if they have questions. Any questions from the committee? Um, thank you all for being here tonight. I really appreciate it, and I'm sure the committee does too, is just from the nodding heads we've seen so far. Um, one of you mentioned uh, being part of the restorative justice program at the high school, and I was curious, given the comment from the, the young lady who just spoke about uh, bringing a panel of mental health specialists, how, if at all, you've considered integrating those two aspects of the work that you'd like to do uh, to each other. Do you see them coordinating in any way, or is this just sort of like an added uh, event or thing that you would like to do? Um, the restorative justice, we are trying to bring people together in like a circle to resolve conflicts and um, build community. Um, and we haven't talked about integrating them exactly that way yet, so it'd be an added um, portion at this moment but it could be something that we could do in the future um, at this moment in time though for the restorative justice we were planning on doing something with um, women's like women bonding it's like a sister like thing should that should be cool um, so that's what we have as like a plan soon versus something that could happen maybe in the next semester or possibly next year. Um, so, yeah. Serena? What one accomplishment did you achieve in the past year? First 
for MSAN or the for MSAN? MSAN? Uh, these are all new MSAN scholars. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh welcome to the new year. <laughs> we do have veteran MSAN scholars, and they will be supporting the work that they have planned for. Um, we have actually worked on a schedule for March. So, so we're going to have a mental health. The oh, class. right. Ah, okay. Right. I, I was just about to ask what your next steps were collectively. So you're, you're, you've already identified a target. Uh, and we a, whole, a whole month of programming, or is this a no, just a month? one day? Okay. But we're hoping there can be follow up um, with resource, maybe a resource table during lunch during the day that we have the panel, and the whole school will go. But we'll have to have two assemblies because we can't all fit in the one auditorium. Right. So um, I've, I've um, been looking at um, organizations that might want to come in and have tables also while the day we have the panel. Hey. Were there were there um, other hot topics or thought or priorities that you were thinking of that you debated doing when you selected this one? I mean, that are worth sharing that you'd want to share. Um, so we had kind of two main topics that we wanted to discuss, and the one that we evidently chose was the mental health but the other one that we did want to bring light to was the fact that there aren't that many uh, teachers of color in the school or teachers of color in uh, powerful positions in the school and I feel like with having more teachers who are of color and people I can relate to have gone through most of the experiences I've gone through I feel like that would make my education so much better and I'd have people who I feel very familiar to and just make the school a place where I feel like it's not a burden, but more of somewhere like I'd rather, like I'd like to be just because of these teachers I'd see throughout my day. And I feel like that'd be something very important to have in the school. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. You have other questions? Can I ask, can I ask, can I ask a question that's re related, but seemingly unrelated but related um all of you or almost all of you mentioned that you were in people of color united or poco and i was just curious if there's anything you'd share that you're up to in that organization that would be useful for the committee to know Yeah, so um, Poku uh, has been in the school for a while now. Um, we just try, our main goal for Poku is like to make uh, like the school like a good community for people of color, mm -hmm. to have like an accepting place where they can come do their work and just be like comfortable in a good space. Um, MSAN is like more of like an objective, like a, sort of like an action plan as it's called. Um, so we're like trying to like force or implement uh, like new stuff into the school, while, whereas Poku is like, also, sort of that, but like more as a welcoming place for people of color in our school as well. Thank you. Well, if, if there's nothing else, then it doesn't have to be. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here. Really appreciate you taking the time. So our next uh, agenda item is announcements and Public comments. Are there any announcements from the school committee relating to the regional district? Uh, seeing, you good? Oh yeah, I was just turning on the screen. No, I know. Yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm checking. Yeah, thank you. Uh, seeing none, um, we're <coughs> open for public comments as a remote. Sorry. sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm distracted. It's like a bright shiny object or something. It keeps distracting me. Uh, <laughs> The uh, So it is public comment. Uh, if you do have one, come forward to the microphone, identify yourself. Uh, an individual will have three minutes to speak, and as you can see, we even have a little timer over there <laughs> that will uh, count down to hopefully will be uh, unobtrusive in some way. Somehow less unobtrusive when it's that huge. Yeah, let me see if I can. <laughs> a, little more, a little more subtle before. Uh, any public comments? I'll superintendent with all that work. Uh, no, we appreciate it, and uh, thanks. So public comments will be closed. We'll move to subcommittee updates. Um, budget, budget didn't meet today, no, right? No, it did not meet. Okay. Next time. Okay. I, I 
forgive me. I know I got an email reminding me that I, my services are no longer necessary, um, so I, which is which is cool. But then for that reason, <laughs> I totally it's checked out. Couldn't remember whether it was today or because or uh, because of lack of response. The committee will meet next time. Hmm. Anyway, uh, either way. Uh, so, is there any other committee business? Otherwise, we'll move the SCTF. Just yes. mention that yes. the, the policy subcommittee finally met yesterday, mm -hmm. um, and we've um, set forth a future meeting schedule as well. So our next meeting is in one month. It's first Monday in January. Cool. Which means probably toward the end of January or early February, we're going to have a series of meetings in which we're voting an absolute ton of stuff, yes. or reading mm -hmm. and discussing a ton of stuff. So that's something for you to look forward to. Uh, yes, Superintendent. Uh, might I mention the update from the collaborative? I was going to mention it. Actually. Oh, then I will. No, you don't have to. But anyways, uh, so the collaborative for educational services has determined that in fact um, one representative cannot represent both the Amherst committee and the regional school committee, uh, and they are uh, begging our indulgence to have somebody come from the regional committee uh, at least three meetings a year. Uh, they say they're so productive and enjoyable that you'll want to come many more times than that. Uh, but that uh, they'd love to have volunteers. Anyone interested in volunteering? What day is that? What day are they? Wednesday. I think, I think it's Wednesday evening. evening. It's, every, it's every other month, um, and they offer dinner. <laughs> and apparently it's Wednesdays. I think it's, it's Wednesdays. Yeah. It's usually Wednesdays. Going yeah. back and forth between Northampton and Greenfield. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Oh. Okay. <laughs> that sounds like a volunteer. Do we, we have that? To... <laughs> Good. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, anything else we've forgotten? Okay. Uh, so, SCTF. Yeah. So, um, I just wanted to, uh, a couple of items that we had wanted to bring to the committee's attention for discussion. <coughs> um, we had a meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago, actually, with um, our subcommittee, and uh, both co-principals from the middle school were in attendance, and I see them in the audience today. Um, and it was a very good conversation. It was basically about thinking through uh, how we might bring restorative justice program to the middle school level, not just the high school. Um, and I believe that they will be speaking about that later on, um, so <coughs> we'll hear more about that. Um, the, the main thing, though, that I think we wanted to address tonight was really just uh, a discussion for the committee to decide on whether or not the, um, the goals that have put, put forth, the budget priorities and the superintendent goals, uh, should be formally voted on. And I've spoken with Dr. Morris about it and with the chair, um, and, uh, you know, it sounds like we could probably go either way, but I think what we're looking for, from the subcommittee anyway, is just a you know formal adoption of the, the budget priorities and the goals. Even though we've already adopted the goals previously, and uh, Ms. Cunningham has presented on them, and the, the district has done a lot of work already in moving it forward, uh, we really just want to make sure that the committee is uh, supportive of the goals as they've been presented and that if there's any further conversation or discussion that we can have at, at this time. Is that a fair representation of, yeah. Um, so I think all of you have had a chance to review it. I know there was a discussion. I wasn't at that meeting in October because I was actually traveling for work. Um, but the, you know, it's, it's really more about fine tuning or refining the goals that have been previously adopted and presented. And um, I don't know if there's anything else that either the chair or Dr. Morris want to say about that. Um, yeah, I, well, I'm trying to think just process-wise, should we hear from the middle school? Or you'd rather wrap this up and then hear from the middle school. I, I, however, you, I mean, you know, you had the conversation before. Uh, I am happy to hear from the middle school first out of the same principle that we had <laughs> earlier, that if somebody's bothered to come here, show up and set themselves up to speak, uh, I'd rather hear from them first. Okay, so I can introduce Joseph Smith and Rebecca Sweetman, who are um, just going to do a summary of the kind of the dialogue that they had at that meeting and a little follow up of what's happened since then. Sure. Great. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks so much. And we Good do evening. want to try to run back to our, our chorus and band and orchestra concert that are happening. <laughs> <laughs> That's so awesome. <laughs> so. Try to yeah, yeah, yeah. so it was a pleasure um, to be invited and to be able to um, speak with the task force. Um, 
the other evening, I guess it was a couple of weeks ago now, yeah. it seems like time is flying. Um, we talked about a lot of things in regards to equity in the school and how we're looking at that, not just in regards to um, restorative practices, but uh, the school as a whole. Um, and so a, a big piece of that was what was really important to us starting was giving all students a, a voice um, in the building and, and making sure that all students have a place. And so we were able to bring back student council and a student voice group in the school for the first time um, in a while. Um, and we held elections along the same um, timeline as the elections that happened in November. Um, and those happened then and they were announced um, around the beginning of November. Our top three officers are students of color, so we're really happy that that is um, the case. And yeah, so since the beginning of the school year, Rebecca and I, Ms. Sweetman and I, we have had a focus on social justice at the school. Um, one of our interviewing points was to look at disparities in, um, in um, what was it? Discipline, <laughs> our favorite topic. <laughs> Uh, and so with that being said, I know that Dr. Morris had uh, started out the year with all of the staff members, leaders of the uh, district, um, doing implicit bias. Ms. Reed and I then took that back to our school and we introduced that to our staff. And we have made that part of our uh, cornerstone, if you will, with all of our staff meetings. So we do a little bit on implicit bias. In addition to that, we look at um, how we're going to reduce the rates of uh, unsuccessfulness for students of color in terms of uh, academic and social. So we want to bring this new uh, thing the students were talking about in terms of restorative practices to our school. And so we have uh, decided to bring a, a position down to our school that's going to support the dean as well as students. So, so that's posted now. Um, we also are working on looking at our um, equity and access to the courses that we offer and also making sure that we're offering the correct courses. So right now we know that we're lacking in um, math interventions and if we're going to close gaps then we need to offer the appropriate courses for our students to help them um, achieve at high levels um, and make sure we're providing the supports to do so. Um, and we see that there are gaps in that right now so we're looking at how we're going to address that for the coming year. So in addition to that we have been doing uh, assemblies on anti-racism and we've been having follow-up groups with our advisory committee. So we're doing a lot yeah. right now. Right. Are you open to questions, if there's any questions from the committee? Yeah? I just want to say, again, you know, um, I know that I, I'm not going to speak for the SCTF, but the, the conversation with both of you was really helpful. Um, and I think it was great to hear that you're thinking about a lot of the issues and concerns that we've raised both at this committee and also subcommittee, but frankly the community um, around discipline disparity and uh, your commitment to trying to get as much data and information as you possibly can about what's happening, you know, in the classrooms and across the school is, is really helpful and important as well. Um, and I think to hear your discussion about, you know, that you're already thinking about how you might be able to bring restorative practices to the middle school level, which is something that we've heard from the students, we've heard from, you know, from many others for a while now, um, because that way they can actually carry it through their adolescence into their high school years. It's not just something that they get, with, you know, the tail end of their, their public school education. So it's, it's really great to hear that. Um, and I, you know, I think I, both of you have already received an invitation for the next SETF meeting in January. We'd you know, love to have you there. Um, but I think having participation from our principals in this way and from other you know, educators and administrators is really useful when we're having those kinds of conversations. So thank you for taking the time to do that. I look forward to engaging with you in January. Yeah, and I guess I, I have another question that um, sort of lines up on topic, but it's slightly different. Uh, and my assumption is the um, the Alana Cub, it's district wide, right? So for the so for the the middle school, I'm just curious. I mean, so when I think about an an environment in which um, everyone's valued, students are an environment where they're appreciated and achieve regardless of their background or even celebrating everyone's background. Um, you know, the sort of the other, the, the two sides of it are what the student experience is, but then also what the staff experience is around it, that both in terms of how they're learning and developing what they're doing, but also literally how they feel when they come every day um, to work. And I was wondering if, Without, I realize I'm putting it in a spot because that wasn't what you were coming here for. <laughs> I was just wondering, since since I think if we throw that into the 
the pot two, that ends up being almost the entire agenda. I'm just wondering if you have any observations, you know, half a year in around some things that have, have gone well or things you're looking to do in that regard. Rebecca and I, since the beginning, have decided that we are really learning about the school culture mm -hmm. at arms, and we're not making any great changes. Uh, what we've noticed is that there seems to be a stratification with what students are experiencing and what some teachers may be experiencing. This is why we know it would be helpful to have this um, restorative justice program at our school to help us with the school climate and culture. Great. Yep. Thank you. Mr. Yeah, I just wanted to say, uh, um, if you know, as you go through this process and you see um, possibilities of, of resources that you might need, feel free to come back and talk about it. Obviously, budgets are always tight, so it's 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 not like a, a promise thing, but it's I think it's really important, particularly at the middle school level. I remember, that, you know, my, my kids, I have three kids, and they're two years apart, mm -hmm. so I was a middle school parent for six years straight, so I got a really good <laughs> in-depth dive, and um, you know, uh, the the major theme I I I, um, I had with um, middle school administration was, uh, it's, it's so hard for, for people if you're not like in the thick of it, there's so much churn and activity going on at the middle school level um, to know exactly what you need and, and, and when. So, you know, you know, open lines of communication with the uh, school committee is, is, is awesome. So, we appreciate yeah. that. We'll take you up on that. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. Thank, thank you. Any other thank questions? You. Then thank you so much. Thank you. So much. Thank you. Enjoy the concert. <laughs> I'm sure it's wonderful. Uh, so we're still mid-item, actually. So back, nice pause. Uh, so uh, uh, what I'd love to do is I'd love to um, hear from this is the superintendent, the superintendent, and hear your thoughts. Um, the two things uh, I would say at sort of the outset are, are that are which is is sort of framing at least my thoughts on this, anyways. Are are that one, um, the committee adopted the top line goals, and so. I don't, we, we could revote them, but I don't think we need to, because to me, the commitment is still in place, that the top line goals that we're trying to ad adopt, we are trying to adopt, and we need to and build that into all the work we're doing, whether it's policies or budgeting and other activities. Um, the second thing is, is that we're in the middle of a strategic planning process, and uh, to me, and I've talked, I've said, I think I said this at a previous meeting, but I also said this to the superintendent before, part of what I'm trying to understand and I want to understand is how um, these goals, some, since a number of them also include sort of data and reporting, the data and reporting of the goals, and then also how we build it into a culture of continuous improvement in which these goals are aligned with everything else we're doing or integrated with everything else we're doing as a district. How is that going to happen? <laughs> and how is that going to happen between you know now and the point where the, strat the district improvement plan or school strategy is developed and put forward? And I'm saying that before, you, before both of you talk, because to me, part of what I'm looking to understand is um, uh, whether, A, there's common agreement to do that. Because to me, whether the committee needs to vote the specifics of the, of the memorandum that we received is partially tied to whether there's any ambiguity or disagreement over the objectives. And I say that because some things could be done this year, some things might need to be happen over a year and a half or two years or whatever the judgment is, your professional judgment is. And that's part of why you have a strategy, right? Because you know you can't do everything at once. Some things you have to do over time. You also know if you don't measure it and report it, then you don't know what's happening and no one knows what's happening. I'm not sure that's some dumb, but I'm, I'm, I'm providing a context here because I'm, uh, the context I'm getting at is, to me, uh, simply voting the goals and the objectives underneath it is sort of a blunt instrument that doesn't really tell me whether anything's actually changing over time and whether things are really being implemented. To me, what matters, to me anyways, and to me the culture sort of of change with the school committee, if we're doing this right, <coughs> working collaboratively with the leadership of the district and the community, is actually knowing things are changing over time and having it reported and being transparent and getting good data and also being able to align our budget both now and year over year in a way that makes 
makes that continuous progress, knowing that things are never perfect, so that the bumps, and I say this also again, because again, not to belabor sort of the endless history of this district, but if you don't have, to my mind, if you don't have that framework, and you don't have that shared agreement for, for improvement, then every hiccup in the road, whether it's uh, a minor thing, or let's say for sake of argument, it's a great recession and you know things fall, you know what I mean? Or the roof collapses in the middle school or something, right? And there's some big thing that happens and everyone has to focus their attention on it. And so you lose traction on the goals you're trying to make. Uh, and then so th then people point fingers, understandably, because there's not a shared agreement, there's not shared trust, there's not a shared plan. People point fingers and say, well, I wasn't sure you ever really committed to begin with, right? How do you avoid that? You avoid that by having that plan, having that transparency, having that data, and then really sort of continuously working it and coming back to it over time so that, so that the, the trust is built, but it's also completely transparent. Everyone can kind of see what's happening and where you're going. Um, so that's the context that, at least in my mind, I'm sort of laying out for this. Uh, and to, and the, I guess the only further thing I'd say is, is that relative to any, any specific sort of goals and objectives, is what I'd also like to know is if there's a realistic perspective or sort of counter, I don't say counter proposal, but whatever the phrase is, any information that you think would be useful for the committee to have to be able to figure out what would those objectives look like or what should those objectives look like that are realistic for us to be able to say, okay, we can have a shared agreement to do this, move it forward and do it within a strategic framework. That, I think that'd be useful for the committee to know so that you don't end up having, again, sort of a blunt conversation of either you're all in or you're not in at all or you're not sure what you've committed to. Mm -hmm. So I'll start. I feel like, two, like I feel like I was just on a couch, therapist couch, <laughs> sort of sharing every view I had on the subject and I apologize. But I was trying to do that because I think it's helpful to yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'll just do a, a little bit of introduction and, and turn it over to Ms. Cunningham. So I think I'll speak specifically to a point about strategic planning, yeah. um, and then Ms. Cunningham can um, lead us a little bit more in detail about the recommendations and goals. So I think you're right, uh, and I agree with you that you know we have this strategic planning effort. Um, the School Equity Task Force has a member that is, um, is part of that, and I don't say that to say that that's one out of a large group, um, but it was important to have that group represented uh, within uh, the planning team, which is 36, 37 people large, including um, parents, teachers, um, and students. And so um, what I would say is, in our we have our second meeting coming up in a couple of weeks, but in our first meeting, all of the topics that are on the, the recommendations came up in some way, shape, or form, right? And not just from the one kind of a appointed member from SETF, but from students, from faculty, and from other parents, guardians. So I do think um, that process can take a while, how it congeals and how the priorities kind of um, get normed. Uh, and, and so that's an ongoing part of our work. But what I, I think is, it is important to note that in the first meeting, it wasn't absent these, and no one brought these recommendations. No one brought these pieces of paper. It was a futures protocol, so you were envisioning what the future, you, what you'd want the future to look like in three to five years in the district. And, and many of these topics, actually all of these at least were touched upon, and many of them were kind of uh, resoundingly touched upon by many, many participants in that effort. So as that work continues, and as that sort of crowdsourcing, we're now, you know, members are getting more feedback on the visioning from their networks, uh, and when we come back together in January, we're going to see a lot of these things in the plan, not because necessarily myself or Ms. Cunningham are saying, no, they need to be in the plan, but actually because the group has the level of representative diversity, um, and by diversity, I'm not just talking about identity, it's also diversity of viewpoints, uh, but these are things that there are many in the community who are pushing for and advocating for, and, and, and I feel very confident they'll be reflected in the strategic plan to come. In the short term, because right, that process play out over the spring, you know, into perhaps next summer. In the short term, we have a lot of work that we're doing, and that's why I wanted to. Can, can I ask one yeah. thing now, please, with, with the committee's indulgence? Yeah. Um, if if the memo hasn't been shared with <laughs> the uh, working group of the planning process, can we? Can you do so? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But I think I'll turn to Ms. Cunningham to <laughs> talk about the specific goals in this this particular um, school year. So I know that we received six goals, and um, they were presented at the other the meeting two months ago. 
And as I look at each one, I have to think many different ways. So the last meeting that we had, we had the Human Resource Department here, which had three members and an assistant, um, admin assistant. So our department is very small, right? And Dr. Morris had talked about how the funding to do a lot of the data, uh, collect the data, and, and do some of the analysis that's needed would be pretty hard for such a small department to try and get done. We started preparing all that information that you saw in our slides last time. We started preparing it from September to get it ready for the November presentation. And it wasn't until about a week before that presentation that we were able to gather everything that um, we felt you would need to, to see where we went with the goals, right? So that being said, I'm looking at these six goals, and each of them requires some kind of uh, collection of data, some kind of analysis, some kind of plan to be created, some kind of implementation of the plan, and then again, some kind of evaluation at the end of the plan, right? And what I would ask is that instead of us having six goals for this year that we have to do all of that for, that the committee considers limiting to maybe two or three goals, right, so that we can deepen the analysis, deepen the work, do some more implementation, and possibly even look to institutionalize the things that we're doing so that it's something that's taking place every year. And so um, we also, we looked at some of the percentages, and I know one of the slides that we presented last meeting showed that at the regional level, the number of African-American teachers actually outweigh the percentage of African-American students. And so when I look at some of the percentages that they're asking us to look at and, and change, I would like to find a way that we can um, look at the data and see exactly what's needed and maybe adjust those percentages to, um, to just be correct because if I read some of the goals correctly, it's saying reduce, right, and have the numbers be the same or similar, and we've exceeded the numbers. So in truth, what are we looking to do, right? So um, I would like for the committee to just take some of those things into consideration. As you look at the goals, just one, can we limit the amount from six, maybe to two or three, that we deepen? We only have about six more meetings, maybe? Um, six, more months six, yeah. six more months of meetings. Yeah. So to have us come and present on six goals ev every month is, is going to be pretty tough for our, our very small department. So that's, you know, something that I just wanted to chime in on. Have yeah, I mean, and so Ms. Cunningham and I spoke earlier, and I think we're, we're certainly um, willing to have a discussion of, of which goals. <coughs> Let me say two things, actually. One is that all of these goals are things that the district's actively working on. So um, mm -hmm. when we're, when Ms. Cunningham and I are sharing that we're looking for a couple to do deep dives on, it's not saying, oh, yeah, we're, gonna, we're just going to disregard the other yeah. goal areas. It's about which do we gather data, which do we come and present, and, and I, I really like the phrasing that Ms. Cunningham used, which do we make more institutionalized so that next year we're just we're repeating the things, you know, at a, maybe at a higher level that we're doing. And at six is, is just a number that we find challenging. Um, you know, I think number two is something that was already presented on and is certainly something that's been a topic of conversation that I think you heard it from students tonight. Um, number two, I'm sorry, not everyone may have the right. document in front of you. I apologize. So number two, I'll just read it aloud. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Uh, so I, I just wanted to say just a micro comment and maybe Super Tank can say, I'm a little uncomfortable having this conversation in such depth right now about the goals and all these references to details. Like, we don't have this in our packet. It wasn't part of the... Like, the agenda says SCTF subcommittee update, and that's it. And so this is, like, all sort of coming to us now at this moment. And so I'm sort of scrambling going back through my past meeting notes about trying to find the, the goals and what the discussion was. And, you know, I want to have the most beneficial conversation to the committee and the district to just finding it a little hard to mm -hmm. sort of focus in on exactly what we're trying to do tonight. But just continue. I don't honestly think we're going to make a decision tonight because one thing is not an agenda item to make a decision on. I think we're going to have to have an agenda item on a meeting. What's our next meeting? 
15th, maybe? Does that sound about right? That sounds about right, yeah. January, January 15th, 15th yeah, I believe. Yeah, I'm sorry. to be on the agenda on January 15th. We'll have to do like an item on January 15th. Yeah. So I think maybe just hearing that feedback, mm -hmm. if I could slightly turn my comments, thanks, Mr. Demling, um, that I think on January 15th we could share probably more specifics on thoughts and people could prepare a little more for the conversation uh, as we view the six goal areas and what are things that we're actively digging in on with the data and, and maybe could make some recommendations. I feel like that's mm -hmm. fair. That'd be good. Ms. Hernandez? Mr. Hernandez? <coughs> so um, I just wanted to, to point out, I, I think I appreciate <clears throat> the concern that there's not a, uh, you know, that we don't have the goals in front of us. Um, However, I think we're having sort of a circular conversation because as both Dr. Morris and Ms. Cunningham and even Mr. Nakajima have mentioned before, these goals have already been adopted and um, there's not very much that's new in here except right. for just creating some fine tuning about you know, how we arrive and how we hold ourselves accountable. And I think my, my comment is that you know, if we don't actually attach numbers, like any evaluation, right? you don't know if you're making progress unless you actually start to attach some numbers to it. And I know you're going through this process internally as it is. What we're looking for, I think, at the subcommittee level is an opportunity to figure out what those numbers are. So working in you know, conjunction with you, of course, uh, but finding numbers and you know, holding ourselves accountable to that and then being transparent about what that looks like. And so <coughs> um, you know, I think a lot of these, looking at these, these goals, we have had numerous conversations around what these goals are. I know that they're actively being worked on. Uh, you know, with all due respect, I think when I hear we want to reduce six goals to maybe just a couple of goals, to me, I'm not quite sure what that means because I, I've heard from, you know, from others in the district already that you are already working on these. So I'm not sure how we would reduce these goals or does that mean we take away the work that you're already doing or is this, you know, so I think we just, we, we definitely need to come back and have a longer conversation about that and mm -hmm. decide at a committee level, um, you know, if, if there's some sort of shift or something that needs to happen. I'm really happy to hear that the strategic planning process is incorporating a lot of aspects of this. Um, I, I would love to see the memo and be able to, you know, to kind of learn a little bit more about what that is because I haven't been part of those conversations. And I know that we have one member of the SETF that is currently sitting on the committee. Um, that person has been traveling though and hasn't been able to report back on you know what's actually and I, and I don't believe you've actually had any meetings this this past month. No, it won't be till the it, just based on people's schedules. Exactly it was after right. the new year. So, yeah. um, so all that to say that we still you know this is just the very beginning stages, which is great because it gives us an opportunity to you know uh, incorporate all of this together at the same time that we're also thinking about these. But you know I, I am very conscious of the fact that we've been talking about these specific goals for a while now. And I think for various members of the community, what I keep hearing is frustration because it feels like you know we're, we're sort of moving in a certain direction and then we sort of stop ourselves. And so I think the community is looking for you know just again a process for us to hold ourselves accountable, so that it's clear that the work that is actually taking place is you know having progress, right? Is making progress, and that we can actually show that to to everyone. So, Mr. Medina. <clears throat> okay. Can I just say that um, we did report on some of the work that we're doing. Mm -hmm. And when I talk about reducing the number, it's not that we're not going to work on the, these things. It's the number that we are diving deeper in our presentation to the community about. So we're still doing the work. We are just saying that it took from September until mid-November to get the data from someone else who's collecting it so that we can put it all together to come here to report. And so if you're looking for us to report on six goals, if it took two months, that's a whole nother year, right? If you, two times six, 12 months, right? And then you have the summer. So all of this cannot, I feel, be reported on as quickly as one year, one school year worth of time. So I'm saying if we limit the amount that you're asking us to report on to something that we can say we can do, and uh, I think uh, Mr. Nakajima mentioned, you don't want us to say, yeah, we're going to do it, and then it falls <coughs> through the crack, or, or we're, we're just saying it to say it. I don't want to do that. When I say I'm going to be able to do four goals or three goals or two, then we know that 
we're going to come back and give it justice at this table, right, before the audience, before the community. So that's what we're talking about. It's not saying that none are important or that we're not going to do it. We are, but the reporting is what we're asking for, the ability to report on two or three. So you know what I'd love to do, because we also need to close this um, subcommittee topic. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'd love to. I'd love to follow. I mean, if we, I think a this should be on the agenda in January, mm -hmm. and then b we should. Um, if the chair of the SCTF is willing to do it, um, I think we should follow up outside of this meeting in preparation of the next meeting okay. to try to continue to talk through. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, what's going to be discussed and presented in January too, so that that's a productive conversation. Because I also, I mean, I agree. I agree. We've been. We've been at this long. I mean, what I'm a we've been at this long enough that it'd be great to have everyone feel like we've turned a corner in terms of the progress we're making. But also, I'd sort of say that if that's what can it feel like from our side of the table or from the community's perspective, I'm also regularly hearing from uh, the leader, the district staff leadership, professional leadership, that they're doing a lot of this work already and maybe not feeling as heard as they could be on the amount of work that's actually being done. And so there's a good log jam to break there on both sides, I think. Mm -hmm. um, superintendent's update. Sure, so I, it's, it's a rather lengthy one. Um, and I know there's people waiting to present, so I'll, I'll try to do some highlights, um, so especially since it's written out. So I think worth mentioning, last week uh, we had our December RIAC meeting, RIAC is Racial Imbalance Advisory Council. Um, it's, the council's gotten much larger this year with broader representation, uh, which has been great. It was in Worcester. Um, and the agenda included a discussion of equity positions at DESE, so they've reorganized their leadership at DESE, um, frankly, in some ways that we were, we, that align with the district's values and district's organization. Uh, and Dr. Rodriguez, who is a senior, is now a senior associate commissioner, who now, um, whose title and responsibilities is um, more connected and over to oversight of racial imbalance. Um, we discussed the Influence 100 project, which this uh, DESE is putting on to increase the number of um, high-level district leaders by 100 in the next, I believe, 10 years was their timeline. Uh, it's not launched yet, but they're um, actively working on it. And also reviewing DESE's superintendent rubric to ensure that equity uh, elements are included in the rubric. And we offered feedback to someone from there. So it was a very productive meeting. Um, I think an important statement that is the one below it. So tomorrow, uh, December 12th, the USDA plans to roll back some of the nutritional requirements that came out in 2010. Um, so just there was a lot of work that was done and, and particularly attributed to uh, and done by Michelle Obama, um, just to jog people's memory. Um, and the press release indicated that the standards for milk, whole grains, and sodium content would be reduced, um, and they're framing it as, and I'm not trying to be ironic, this is literally the wording, is um, flexibility for districts to choose how much whole grains, sodium content, and how much flavored milk they serve. And so we've made the decision, and Sasha Palmer is um, strongly, in, uh, she made the decision, I'm just able to report on it, that we're going to hold ourselves to the higher standards. We're not going to reduce the standards we have for nutrition because the Thanks. federal government is planning to allow us to do it. So, uh, and Ms. Palmer feels very strongly on it, and she's happy to come and tell you exactly how she feels sometime in the future um, <laughs> about this. But this is this is not flexibility we're looking for. It's not flexibility we're going to take advantage of. But since it probably would be a big press release tomorrow, we wanted to let people know ahead of time that that's how we're going to respond to it. Um, Speaking of uh, the human resources presentation last month, um, last week, Ms. Ortiz, who you met, uh, she gave a presentation called Equity in Food Services at the Farm to Sea School Conference in Lemonster, talking about diversity in our hiring process and uh, the feedback from another one of our staff members was in the audience for that and just the number of questions, comments, and how do you do that, how can we do that was very significant about diversifying the food service staff. So um, kudos to Ms. Ortiz. High school principal search, so last week we sent a survey to all secondary staff and grade eight through seven families, I should say also nine through 12 students, um, to gather feedback on the desired qualities of the next permanent high school principal. We also asked for volunteers to search to serve on a screening committee to recommend finalists for the position. Ms. Cunningham's organizing and facilitating the search, so thank you, Ms. Cunningham, for your work, and we've contracted with NESDEC. Um, they can do a lot of recruitment. They um, call people, they send mailers to every principal, and you know, um, in, in the region. 
uh, and they're assisting us with national advertising as well. So we'll look to come back and get that really kicked off in a major way in January, but we're sort of in the fine-tuning advertising and posting phase right now. Um, tomorrow, when the early release day, um, all faculty and staff from the high school, Summit Academy, and the middle school, and also some central office staff who weren't here last year for this, uh, will have professional development offered by Ed Mitnick. He was the one, if you were on the committee last year, he led us, uh, the district leadership in professional development last February, I believe. And his work, he works with MCAD, he, and it's focused particularly on uh, healthy workplace harassment discrimination, and what we know is that proactive training is uh, critical. Once you've had an incident, things are much more complicated uh, for obvious reasons, but if we can be on ahead of that. And what we find and what he finds uh, is that the training itself is an intervention because people then have an ability to talk about things in a really healthy way and it really opens the door to conversations that need to occur. And he's done similar work in the Holyoke Public Schools, Tufts and Northeastern University, the town of Framingham, and Boston Scientific. We did invite some town of Amherst staff. It's a large, right, it's going to be 300 people. So it's not like an extra couple people is going to make or break the uh, presentation. So I know there's some uh, visitors from the town of Amherst staff who are also interested in coming, so we invited them. So we'll have some, a little bit of crossover between the town and the schools, which is always a nice thing. Um, we have a STARS grant for vaping. Uh, Maybe we can come back to that as we talk about well-being a little later. Um, so I'm just conscious of time and the number of people here. Thank you all for those of you who are able to make it, including the littlest one at the Fort Town meeting. Um, it's distracting. She's very cute. Um, no, 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 it's no sorry. It's like compared to most Fort, I'm looking for that distraction at most <laughs> meetings. So it, it was. Uh, I'm think I should be thanking you, but um, it was a very productive. Uh, I felt like very productive Fort Town meeting and just follow up already that has started with that. Um, but, you know, I feel optimistic about the towns working together to come up with a solution. So thanks to the leadership of the school committee on that. Um, last year we started, we're doing it again, visiting Leverett and Shutesbury Elementary Schools so that we talk with students and families. Uh, I'd say this just because you're all welcome. Uh, Shutesbury, Mr. Sullivan, on board January 31st. And his baking is worth the trip to Shutesbury if you are, do not live in Shutesbury. That I can guarantee you. And we'll also go to Leverett. And that's sort of tongue-in-cheek, but not. Because some of you experienced his baking last year at regional school committee meetings. And it's top-notch. That hasn't happened this year, has it? Ooh. I, no, I'm not sure to put it on the spot. <laughs> I am. <laughs> yeah. Um, Those cookies were delicious, but they were free of everything. They weren't gluten, they didn't have calories. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Menino, that comment is totally out of order. Your first comment was that they were delicious, which means they weren't free from everything because they had delicious taste. Um, and I think I'll mention uh, just a couple more, and I apologize for the length of this, but I think I'm having a hard time skipping yeah. some of these. So Laramie Projects, Mr. Bechtold is here. Um, kudos to you. Uh, unfortunately, it, my family, someone, we had a, someone pass away, and I wasn't able to, it wasn't, a, the age of my children and the Laramie Project weren't a great match, um, but I know many people, including staff who went, who just were raved about the performance, so we'll hear from you later, but I just want to publicly acknowledge you and your work for that. Um, uh, we had a middle school student speak at a DESE conference. Um, the video, I think we, we had permission, so we put on our district Facebook page. It's worth watching. Uh, it was talking, she's a VELA student, she was talking about what VELA means to her, and um, really exciting that they, they hadn't included students before and they chose our student to present at this conference. Um, Mary Maple was wonderful, faculty meetings. I think the last thing I'll say is that we've had a couple incidents at the high school in the last week or two where individuals have felt vulnerable and hurt. And I want to acknowledge that. I think everyone here has seen the letter that was shared with the community and our approach in all of those uh, challenging situations, one is to communicate frequently with those who feel harmed, um, to understand where they're coming from and how they experience the pain, uh, to repair and restore relationships, which sounds really easy and it's actually quite complex. It's among the most complex work that we do is when someone uh, has experienced harm, how do we um, change that dynamic and how do we support um, alleged victims and alleged um, perpetrators or people who may have created harm. Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, the thing that we can do best is to create positive relationships out of challenging moments. Uh, are also, from an administrative lens, we're looking to analyze what happened so that we can improve our systems. So that we, we uh, this is not code to make things sound happier, but we try to look at these as learning opportunities. Uh, it's not to minimize the, the, the pain that um, 
individuals feel, but we want to use these as opportunities for us to learn about how to do things better and how to prevent these situations from the past and how to improve our response to those situations and perhaps how to use them as an education moment both for, for everyone in our community. And that's how we approach challenging situations. That's how we've approached the situations that we're experiencing. And we continue that work of what's the right education and how do we um, not look at this as isolated um, situations, but what does it tell us about ourselves more generally, and how do we improve organizationally um, so that people can feel safe, confident, and comfortable um, going to school, being a staff member in our school, and being a school community member. So we take this incredibly seriously, um, and um, I think what I really want to compliment Dr. Gramacki and her team at the high school, who has been juggling many, many things over the last couple of days, and their particular eye on keeping students at the forefront of our focus, and everyone's health and well-being at the forefront has been, in my opinion, exemplary in responding to, you know, particularly challenging situations. So I really want to acknowledge Dr. Gramacki and her team um, for, for how this goes, and, and you know, the, the messaging matters. Um, and I don't mean the public, the public messaging does matter, but uh, to be honest, uh, a great deal of focus has been how do we talk to individuals who are connected to these things, uh, honor the humanity in the moment uh, of all, and then how do we successfully move forward in a productive way um, to improve our community and our work. So um, that's, all, I think, all I'll say on that piece, but I did want to acknowledge um, what's been happening at the high school and how we're planning to move forward. Are there any questions from the uh, comments from the school committee? <coughs> Seeing none, thank you, Superintendent. Thank you. Um, my only, my only report would be that um, we uh, uh, have to follow up from the four town meeting last week, and <coughs> the uh, Mr. Mangano sent out a letter today, I guess, this afternoon. To yeah. this afternoon, to uh, with, did we get a copy of the PowerPoint. You will tonight, yeah. Okay, yeah. good. <laughs> I, I was going to say, I was really going to say, they sent a copy of a PowerPoint out to members of the four towns of Southern Rosing. We didn't get it, so. Yep. Feels felt odd when you get home, that. it will be there. Okay, yes. <laughs> well, that's cool. <laughs> and uh, and and what it also was doing was inviting uh, a representative of each town to meet uh, with Mr. Mangano, the superintendent, and myself to try to talk through um, next steps on what the a shared agreement might be around the regional assessment, with obviously deep appreciation that everyone was. Um, on the record, shooting for a level services budget for the year, which is a great start to that process. Um, we can, if anyone wants to wants to join uh, the meeting, you can. We can't have quorum of the school committee, but if you if anyone wants to join, let let us know, and we'll let you know when the meeting comes up. Uh, and obviously, we'll this will be on the agenda again, and it'll have to be, and hopefully, you know, it'll be continued to be good news and progress. I'm so sorry I did that. <laughs> you know the funny thing is I'm actually subdued compared to usual. Usually I'm like a rodeo clown at these meetings and tonight I'm actually keeping it together. Um, inadvertently, I wasn't even trying to be subdued. Uh, with, with that, the rodeo clown is done for the moment. Uh, and it's we're only like six minutes behind it, like five or six minutes behind. Yeah. Um, new ARH courses, uh, who wants to introduce? So I'm going to introduce Dr. Gramacki, perhaps to, um, there's a number of staff members here to introduce the original, the, um, there's actually three courses. Um, Can you remind me of something? Yeah. Are you, are you anticipating us uh, taking an action tonight? Um, I think if the committee's comfortable voting tonight, um, that'd be great. If not, then we can bring it back to the January 15th meeting. Nice. Either I, way just, I always want to start with, so what are we doing? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, I should have Thank framed you. it that way. Um, so it's just really the three, the Chinese language and culture course, which Dr. Gramati will I'll explain that, yeah. Um, so thank you. And we actually hope that you can vote tonight so that we can move forward with our um, program of studies and course planning. Uh, so the three, it, it, and I will say that in light of years of budget cuts, I think it's really exciting to continue to come and advance, you know, elective courses and continue to constantly revisit our offerings to make sure that, that we're that were staying relevant and viable. So we had originally had um, a Chinese language and culture class as an alternative learning um, program for students where the curriculum was in development. Um, we've decided that we're going to keep it in that format for another year. It seems to be working well. And um, we're not at the place where I think we're ready to propose it as a course offering. So we will not be presenting that tonight, but know that it will still run next year in the high school as an alternative learning program course that does bear credit. 
Um, so tonight I want to introduce, uh, should I just start and have each person come up? Okay. Anyone want to go first? Okay. So I'd like to um, introduce you to Simon Lutz, the Department Head for Social Studies, as well as Chris Gould, one of our Social Studies teachers, and they're going to propose um, an AP World History course. Oh, do you have it on a, do you have it, you could email it to Miss. Well, how do you? Simon had, or Mickey had emailed it to me to see if I could just find that. Yeah. I added some things. Tim, yeah. did he step away? He stepped away. Okay, because he's logged in. I mean, the other thing is you could just log in as you. Sure. That might be the easiest. Right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. It's a distraction. That's the one I was looking for. Thank you, Simon. Sorry, I no <laughs> wasn't queued in for you. No Every year they get younger, right? Not working, but I'll be your clicker. Okay. <laughs> so, um, thank you, everybody. Um, I'm Simon Lutz. I'm the Department of Social Studies. This is Chris Gould. Hi. We're a long time social studies teachers. Um, so, we're going to propose to you adding uh, AP World History to our curriculum in social studies at the high school. So, I, okay, the next slide. Um, right. so I just want to, you can just click through these, I guess, and put them all up. So I just want to first um, give you a quick rundown or overview of what our scope and sequence looks like at the high school. For those of you who might not be familiar with our, um, our course offerings and what it looks like. So uh, we have three years of required social studies at the high school, required social studies courses. Um, uh, Global History One is our ninth grade course. It's a world history course from roughly about 500 to 1700. Um, it's um, very much sort of global, sort of called global, global history, but global in its approach in that um, it looks at uh, sort of major developments in world civilization in the Americas, in Africa, the Islamic world, South, East, Southeast Asia, Europe, um, uh, and tries to do so uh, through the lens of multiple perspectives, tries to look at diverse voices in the curriculum, um, historically marginalized voices. So our, our ninth grade course sort of starts off the first of two years that students will take, 9 through 11, in, in world history. That's global history one. Tenth grade, they take a U.S. history course. The U.S. history course is sort of a U.S. two course. It picks up where they've left off in eighth grade, uh, which is roughly uh, you know, late uh, 19th century after the Civil War. It starts with Reconstruction and goes through you know, roughly Vietnam in the 1970s or so. Um, and then in 11th grade, they do the second year of the two-year sequence in world history in our global history two course. And then finally in 12th grade, there's a range of electives. We have eight elective offerings we're going to offer next year. You can see the list of them there. But we try to offer a range of you know, high interest electives in the social sciences. Students can experience both topics they're interested in as well as you know, specific social science fields, introduction to specific social science fields like anthropology and economics that they might be interested in as well. Thank you. Um, so why, so I'll start with when for the AP Global History and then we can talk about why quickly. Um, the when is going to be junior year. So this will be an alternative to our Global History 2 course. Uh, the curriculum for AP World History roughly lines up with what we have for Global History 2. There's a little bit of overlap with our Global History 1 course as well. But it's, it, it content-wise pro provides a nice alternative to Global History 2 because it lines up well with the content there. Um, so we'll, we'll offer this hopefully next year as an alternative for students to take uh, for their third year of social studies credit and Global History 2. Happy so to take questions that we can wait till we're done. What makes a history course on AP level? We could, we'll talk about that in just a moment. We're going to get to sort of the, the AP structure, um, but the College Board has a specific set of requirements uh, that they, and curriculum that they suggest for these AP courses. 
So the why is, I think, most significantly or most importantly, is that we no longer have an AP course in social studies in the social studies department. We've had one for a long, long time. It was um, European history, but so much of the European history content was folded into our Global History 1 and 2 courses. They no longer made a lot of sense to offer AP history, European history as our AP course. Um, and, and AP Europe, as well as um, a number of other uh, history electives that we had in place, African history, Latin American history, Asian history, where sort of that content was folded into this new two-year sequence in ninth and 11th grade in global history, too. So we took those off the table. So this would replace AP Europe as our, our AP offering. We currently don't have one. I think we're the only department, major academic department right now, that doesn't have an AP offering this year. Um, if you could, I think there's one more maybe bullet there. Sorry. So thank you. Um, great. So the other reason is that I think that this is a good fit. Um, you know, unlike Europe to some degree, right, this is a history with AP World is a curriculum that really does sort of fit our real priority as a department of teaching history through multiple perspectives and diverse voices. So unlike AP Europe, which was a you know, this single, you know, looking at uh, European history in this one place, AP World has us, you know, the requirement of the course, the course is built around make, you know, looking at uh, the experience of peoples from around the world. So Africa is there, Asia, the Americas, Oceania, and actually there's a specific requirement that no more of the course can, no more than 20% of the course can be European in content. So I think it would really, um, again, complement our, our Global History um, two course as an alternative, but also you know, meet this uh, important uh, objective we have in, in teaching history through multiple voices and perspectives and stories. A couple other reasons, you know, these are the, so the top reasons, but a few more, and I'm going to hand it over to Chris to talk okay. a little bit about the course itself. Um, you know, for students who are both motivated and interested, we want to have that uh, chance in, in, the social, in social studies, in the social studies department, to challenge themselves at the AP level, and the AP course does offer um, a greater challenge and more scholarly approach to the study of the global history content. Um, it also, not that our other courses don't do this, I think it's something we do really well, um, but it does have this intense focus on sort of the skills of the historian. How do historians work? How do they have research? How do they ask questions, develop evidence-based responses to those questions, um, support them with the evidence that they found? Um, that's you know, thoroughly infused in the AP content, and again, sort of consistent with our objectives as a department. And then lastly, um, the AP Europe course, with which Chris taught for a long time, has always been, a hallmark of it has been the integration of music and art and literature as vehicles to examine the past, as art as evidence, art as um, history. Um, and the, we'd really like to use this as an opportunity in this course to infuse that same sort of spirit into the AP course, the AP World course. I'm going to turn over to Chris now to okay. talk a little bit about the AP World course itself. Okay, and you can actually hit the next slide. Yeah, I'm going to keep running through. <coughs> Thank you. There you go. So to be fair, many of our courses do incorporate elements of music, art, literature into the curriculum, although um, the AP curriculum really allows and actually demands that you um, take those really more deeply into account when you're creating the course curriculum, when you're thinking about how culture works and how it expresses itself in those um, in those genres. So, um, so the world history course and its organizing principles is really predicated a lot on what the College Board and the AP dictates for what has to be in one of those courses. So um, first it is looking around an investigation of several selected themes, which will be on a slide coming up here, um, woven into some concepts that covers just four chronological periods of study. At the end of the slideshow, I did a um, sort of an example of what that might look like over the course um, of the curriculum. It's not a deep intellectual dive into the seas of history, but should give you an idea of sort of, of how we hope to construct this thing between now and then as we sort of riff on what the Global History II course is now and to adjust it for an AP curriculum. <clears throat> um, and again, the threads that are supposed to unify this are really designed to try to tap into the various unique aspects of the various global cultures that come into contact with each other, how they interact, and how they create a bigger picture of history. Next one. Thanks, Mike. So these five themes were not something we developed, but they are the AP, um, the AP directives for the five themes. So 
Um, first one is interactions between humans and the environment. Second is development and interaction of cultures. Third, state building, expansion, and conflict. That's actually the one I picked for my example coming up. Um, the fourth is creation, expansion, and interaction of economic systems. And the fifth is development and transformation of social structures. So those are really pretty representative of the cultural patterns that we um, preach and investigate in all of our history courses. We have, I know I use a memory device that looks at Persia with a G at the end, which is politics, economics, religion, social structure, intellect, which we look at in terms of education and the creation of new technologies, arts, architecture, even athletics sometimes, and then geography and how those things interact to form cultural identity. Next one, please. And here are the four time periods that the AP dictates for us. Um, so unit one, they're calling regional and inter-regional interactions between 1200 and 1450. So depending on where you are, it's going to have different names. In Europe, we're going to hit a renaissance um, in that period. But in different continents, it's going to have a different identity and a different personality. <clears throat> unit two is global interactions, 1450 to 1750. And again, those first two units are time periods that are covered in the Global One course in ninth grade. Um, and so and Simon and I were talking a little bit more today. Um, we are proposing probably that those first two units would take up the minority of the course, given that we try to look at some new approaches to the material that had already been there, um, try to use some materials and sources that we hadn't before to give both a reminder of what had been you know, encountered in ninth grade, but also to deepen the study of what's there. Um, and then uh, units three and four are become sort of the flesh of what is the Global Two course, and we feel like we'd really be able to do some, um, some profound study there. Industrialization and global integration, um, how those two concepts interact and how they spread into, into all the continents. And finally, accelerating global change and realignments, which brings us from the beginning of the 20th century right up to today. So the course development of the current Global Two course, and for this course also, really looks at um, where we are, how we got here, um, and how to effect change. So I'm anticipating that in this course, particularly whenever a piece of writing is coming to me um, or a presentation is given, that there'll be some attention paid to how is this historical idea relevant to what's happening today. So we can kind of trace one of those five themes that we just looked at through time. That's kind of what I tried to do in these next few slides, which has some image, because we're always trying to get the kids to do more image than text. Um, so, um, so here's an example. I took the theme of state building, expansion, and conflict across the curriculum. So if we started at the, uh, the first time period that we're given, we might be talking about something like Aztec supremacy in Central America, the tribute they collect, the threats of war that they use in order to sort of keep their neighbors under control. Um, uh, and so that would, you know, in, the, in Latin America at least, we'd be able to see that theme even before Europeans arrive. We often sort of think of those things, you know, um, wrongly, I would say, um, from a European pers perspective and how do those things matter to, um, to Western cultures. But I think in this way, we'd be able to look at it in uh, a much broader view. Next one. Um, and so, you know, then the arrival of the Europeans and, you know, we could use a source like the accounts of the Spanish arrival. Um, by Spanish missionaries. You, they could also use what's called the Codex Florentino, which is a whole manuscript of, uh, excuse me, particularly images um, that were primary sources from the time of the arrival of the Europeans. There's some great artwork there of um, some of the indigenous culture that went on and some of, the, um, some of the tragedies that occurred when those cultures interacted with another. So that might be a source we could use or a couple of them. Next one. Um, and then we could look at, um, in the next century, the Latin American revolutions and independence movements, um, a document by Simone Bolivar, who seems to be everywhere in Latin America um, in the early 19th century. Um, an example might be his address at the Congress of Angostura, um, and I just happened to find this image of him that's an, an early 19th century painting um, of the Congress of Cucuta. Um, and again, I just wanted to sort of give some examples of primary source approaches, art approaches, um, manuscript approaches that we could use in addition to some standard texts in looking at this stuff. I think I've got one more. Maybe. No, I've got two more. 
Um, so, you know, getting a little closer to the present, we got the nationalization of oil in Mexico in 1938, which becomes kind of a hallmark of Mexican identity um, and their sort of ability to thrust themselves forward. And then the last one comes right up to today. Um, as Andres Obrador, the president of Mexico, celebrates the 80th anniversary of the expropriation of oil. Um, and so I, I really want us to be able to connect what's happening right now in the papers so that we can go to various current news sources, put up somebody taking a selfie with the president of Mexico, and ask questions like, how did we get here? Uh, yeah, so I, I wish I could take this course. <laughs> um, it's, I, I really love the idea of, of that, you know, that global perspective, the max 20% European history. Um, so it makes me think, so I, I don't think we do this anymore, but it was either fifth or sixth grade in the Amherst School District, we used to, um, some teachers were using guns, germs, mm -hmm. and steel, mm -hmm. uh, so theories of history, yeah. which, which really, you know, and when you look at history from this kind of perspective, those sorts of ideas of why certain cultures came and when they came together, why one, um, you know, was culturally, um, you know, and, and then militarily dominant over the other, those, those questions are begged, right? And so, um, so does this course sort of probe any of those questions, those theories of history, and, um, and, and how does it, how do you, how, like, how does it, how are you thinking about guiding students through that kind of conversation? Well, um, I'm, you're reminding me of a bunch of activities and, thrusts of the AP Euro course that used to exist, and there's a lot of historiography and historical theory that went on there that will lend themselves perfectly to this course. Um, the Global Two course already is looking at some of that material, so we've brought in um, materials that look at, um, if I go to the AP Euro course for a second, so if we look at uh, issues of moving from sort of social history issues, so the AP Euro kids did a social history paper. I'm inclined to think that we'll probably have some, I, some form of that in the Global Two course, um, where they're really forced to look at what happens when you try to tell the stories of people who are not very well documented. Um, who tells that story? How well do they tell it? Um, how much chance and risk are you willing to take? Which was a very difficult but very worthwhile paper for the um, AP Euro students of many years in a row. So historical theory will be a very big part of it. I think it's really important. Guns, germs, and steel is stuff we've used in history courses um, and still use little excerpts of it today in both the global classes. And the AP, I mean, we, we use these in our class. We use historical, you know, we use historians and their work in the classes that we teach, but the AP curriculum requires that you integrate those kinds mm -hmm. of sources and have students looking at interpretations of history and often competing inter interpretations of history. So I, right. yeah, I think that would be a hallmark of sort of what a question, I guess, for the superintendent. How do you arrange that a student who really wants to take this interesting course, do they have course conflicts? How, how do you offer it once, twice, three times a, a year? I mean, uh, what do you do? I'm fortunate to be able to turn this question to Dr. Gramacki, who is much <laughs> more knowledgeable about uh, course schedules. I mean, this has been part of her work. In all seriousness, this is part of um, her work historically at the high school has been trying, and I'm using the word intentionally, the verb intentionally, trying to resolve conflicts that emerge when students want to take courses that don't necessarily align perfectly in the schedule. So do you mind, Dr. Gramacki, if coming up to just be able to respond to that? It's a very real question for, for our students, in fact. Yeah, well, how, how do you decide how to make it available to a student who has a number of choices? I mean, do, are there, well, to avoid conflicts, what do you do? Right, so the most important thing we do is that we take those course requests early and we try to staff the appropriate number of sections. So the, the big bad word in scheduling is singleton. When there's only one at one time, it's very difficult. So as many students as we can get to request the courses, the more sections, and then it provides some relief in the scheduling. So that's the quick answer. We would probably anticipate two sections of this. That's not for, uh, for sure thing. Great. Yeah, so <laughs> two sections of somewhere between 20 and 25 students, yeah. ballparking, you know, something like that. So that at least allows some flexibility depending on what schedules look like. And then, then you know, students, <coughs> if they've got a double conflict, they have to make a decision. You know, it depends where, what it's yeah. conflicting yeah, with. They have to decide what, what they want to do. Great. 
Are there other questions in the beginning? Yes. Um, I, one thing I noticed was that, and I mean, this is maybe just background information, but I noticed the AP College Board had um, cha revised the spectrum, you know, the, uh, so deleting like almost like a millennium of history. Yeah. So, <laughs> so um, I think it was a year and a half ago or so, the um, uh, College Board did announce that they were taking the world, AP World History course, which began in like prehistory, mm -hmm. right, and went to the present. So it was, again, several millennia of world history, <laughs> right, which to me seems overwhelming. And I was, when I saw Partly, I, I was I gravitated towards more towards AP World as a choice when they chopped a whole bunch mm -hmm. off. Um, there was some pushback by AP World History teachers who didn't like the revisions, and their main objection, which I do hear, their main objection was that it uh, it eliminated uh, this millennia of time where students got to understand and appreciate the development of civilizations, cultures around the world prior to European contact, right? So they could start to see um, the sort of unique, rich achievements of world peoples before the sort of the, the Europeans start reaching out and the, and the tragedy, as Chris mentioned, of the, often of the contact between Europeans and, and the rest of the world. So the AP, the College Board heard that, right? and then sort of pushed it back a little bit further, sort of brought a little bit more of that history back in. So I think it was going to start in, like, 50, I don't know, their, their original proposal was to start it in, like, 1500, maybe later, 1700 or something like that, and they pushed it back to 1200, yeah. so that you could see the emergence of civilizations in the Americas, like the Aztec, the Inca, the Maya, you could look at medieval African civilizations, you could look at the achievements of the Islamic world, um, again, prior to the sort of the Europeans um, making contact with these other civilizations. So I, I, that's part of the context. The, I think another important thing about this that we should, you know, that we're aware of and that you should be aware of is that the College Board says that they are going to publish uh, um, uh, some, some more curricular information in January. So especially some models of, you know, they have lots of models online of, well, we're, we're going to have to put together, if you approve the course, is an AP syllabus. They have lots of models online of the, a, the syllabus for the old AP World History course that started way back when, but they don't have any of that kind of information yet available for this revised version. So to some degree, I'm, I'm sort of guessing what those units are based on what I know of the time period that they're suggesting, but we should have a little bit more information about exactly what this is going to look like and exactly the um, Sort of units. I don't anticipate they would change the themes at all. They might break those units down a little bit more finely instead of four. I anticipate there's probably five or six. Um, I don't know if that helps with a little bit more of the context there, sort of what's um, going on. And that actually took me to my next question was to what, um, yeah, to what extent is it on you to develop the syllabus or how much, you know, how much guidance do you get from the AP call, you know, how much freedom yeah. or whatever do you have, the, right, when you're trying Chris to... The AP does give questions. a lot of guidance, but it is a very difficult thing to do to create this. I mean, we did a, we did a, an AP Euro audit three or four years ago, and even just updating what was already there was quite a bit of work. Um, and probably it's really profitable work and that they want to keep the course current, updated according to the newest educational thinking, and that you're addressing you know, historical ideas and themes in ways that are, you know, that seem authentic. Um, and things that were done 20 years ago may not seem authentic anymore. Um, so it's, it's a fair bit of work. I think the benefits we have are a Global History two course that exists, so we can certainly draw elements from that. An AP Euro course that has existed for a long time, we can take some things from that, but we'll certainly need to create some, you know, some different approaches to hit all the bases that the AP demands that we get all the way through. So yeah, they, they, have a, they have a pretty specific sort of checklist that they're looking for in the syllabus um, that ensures that you're you know, integrating where appropriate scholarly sources, that you're integrating primary sources, that you're integrating um, when and where you're going to touch on those themes that we talked about within the content areas. Um, they, I mean, they also insist that you have um, excerpts from or a textbook that's published within the last, I don't, I don't know what it is now, five or six or ten years, but 
you know, so that's one reason that the AP Euro course had to be updated because we had an older book, and so we needed to update and make sure that we were really bringing our teaching of the history right up until the present time, so that that relevant piece became a you know a really um, genuine part of what we were trying to do. Okay. Uh, Ms. Ardonias, Ms. Spitzer, and then Mr. Medina, and then we probably need to move on unless somebody has a burning question. So I um, also just want to uh, second Mr. Demling's comment about wishing that I had been able to take this class <laughs> when I was. Uh, this is wonderful, and thank you for, I'm, I'm glad to hear, especially that there's all the different perspectives that are being brought into, into uh, this material. Uh, I noticed that at the very end of the section that describes this uh, course, that the price of the suggested text is running from 111 to 199 per book, I'm assuming. Why the big variation, and where do we get the pricing for the, the total cost for the course? So um, I, the, the College Board publishes a list of the acceptable, you know, acceptable text. AP texts. Um, I've requested copies of all of them so that we can start reviewing them and see which ones we like. You know, price could might very well be a factor also in which one we select. I'm not exactly sure why there's such a wide range. They do charge you more. It seems the publishers charge you more for AP textbooks than they do for <coughs> non-AP textbooks. And I think to some degree that's because these are college texts and mm -hmm. they tend to charge more for college texts. So they, what they have are sort of these college world history textbooks that they call, that they stamp AP on and then charge high schools a lot more money for. Um, I haven't had a lot of time yet to sift through all of those materials and to see which ones really we think are okay. the ones that are most feasible. But you know, obviously we'll be budget conscious in making a choice. But that's, I was just pricing them online and going to the publisher's websites and seeing what their charge was. It very well might be the case if you're ordering a number of these that the, the salespeople will give you a bit okay. of a discount when you buy them in bulk. But I haven't quite gone that far in my okay. research. Superintendent Morris, did you want to say that? Very briefly, um, that we'd be looking to use this year's budget. We've already looked in, you know, contingent school committee votes that we would not, this, you likely won't see this next month as a budget ad uh, for the FY20 for two reasons. One is we've been conscious and we knew these courses were coming and we've budgeted accordingly within this year's budget. The second reason is the staff are going to need to have the textbooks before July 1st turns or rolls around to, imp to plan and then implement in the fall. So I just, it's not to, take away from the conversation you just had, but it might be a relevant next step question is, is this something we're going to see in the budget? And it may I answer that. I promise you it would have been. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Spencer? Um, thank you so much. So, um, you know, I took European history honors here. Um, graduated in 99, so it was a long time ago. Yeah. And I guess the, the reason I'm um, prefacing with that is that I just want to understand how we're using, and this is a broader question, not just for the social studies department, but when I was a student here, we, did, we had AP in the sciences and math world languages, but we didn't have it in social studies or English, and instead we had like, an honors option. And have we gotten rid of that honors track completely, or why, I guess, and, and if not, why do an AP course rather than creating kind of our own in-house honors this type one? course? <laughs> <laughs> well, we haven't gotten no, rid of it. Okay. No, we haven't gotten rid of an honors option, so. And the um, AP has existed. For a number of years. Yeah, no, I'm just saying, like, that's right. why I preface right. with 1999. But only that one course. <laughs> yeah. only that one course. I mean, yeah, it's I been know. around since, since probably the mid 90s, 90s, at least. The AP yeah. Europe class was. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, I, ch I, I opted because of the instructor, because there's sure. so many awesome options that sure. we have sure, that absolutely. are not under the AP absolutely. rubric. Right. So I guess I'm absolutely. just trying to understand, like, you know, what what's the motivation for having the AP versus kind of our in house? Right. That's a good question. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a good question. So we do have, we will have an honors option still for Global History 2. So you'll be able to take, if you choose to take, so for those who take Global History 2, there will be an honors option within the classroom to, to get, to take Global History 2 for honors credit. But for those students who are seeking a separate, uh, you know, highly motivated, see, seeking a separate um, option for the sort of Global History 2 curriculum, we did want to have this uh, AP course available to people, uh, to students. I think, you know, to me, I, I do think that AP and the way we will build it will represent an even greater level of challenge than our honors courses mm -hmm. do. They tend to ask students to deal in much, in, in even greater depth, right, of content, and at to some degree a faster pace than even our, our honors options will ask of students. Um, so I think this this is going to be a course that you know 
is for very motivated students who want to take uh, a study of history at Amherst High School that represents a, a, the, the greatest sort of level of challenge. Um, I'd also say, and, and, and this is the sort of, and I'll be honest, this is the practical piece of me speaking here too, that I think that there's, there are students in, and families in, in our community that are looking for, for AP courses, um, you know, to build their resumes, resumes for when they apply to college. And that shouldn't be the only reason we do this. This should be authentically an important um, course that really challenges students with a level of rigor and scholarship that they wouldn't necessarily get even in one of our honors courses. But I do think that there's a practical element of this too that I'd like to keep our program at the high school attractive to a wide variety of families in our community. And for some, I think AP is, is part of that package. Sure. So, so, and this is again all anecdotal from 20 years ago now. But um, one of the nice things about having the honors in the same classroom is that I, I was there when they transitioned from having the honors be in a separate classroom to where you take an honors course with the honors students who may have separate texts and write separate papers, but they were all in the same classroom. Mm -hmm. And that really diversified the classroom for me. And so I'm wondering, have we reached a point where now where our AP courses are as diverse as our student body, or are we still seeing the same kind of lack of diversity, for black, lack of a better word, in, in, in the AP courses? Because that would be the only thing that I could see is for not wanting to yeah. Pursue. And, and I, I'm just curious. Yeah. I'm not trying it's to a good question. Uh, so um, when it was only AP Euro, we saw some diversity, but not as much as we wanted. I'll, I'll be honest with that. Um, just that I think probably some of it was what the name of the course was. Um, right. And, you know, the, the, the material that was in there did not appeal even in terms of its topic to, you know, a more diverse population. Now, there were plenty of exceptions to that, but in terms of mirroring what was going on, you know, the population of our school did not typically do that. I think the global, the world history element will have a much better chance of doing that. As you, I'm sure you know, the, um, our courses are not, there's no prerequisites for these courses in terms of what grade you've gotten, much to the dismay of my nephew who goes to school in New Jersey. He can't believe that you can just sign up for a course and take it. Um, and I will say that my experience in the last four or five years with the AP Euro cor course has been, it's not a horror show. You know, it's not this thing that people see as this huge monster and they have to survive it, like, you know, Marine Boot Camp or something. Um, once upon a time, it kind of, it had shades of that, although most of the kids who came through, came through with, with great feelings and affection for it. But it's really trying to stay within the bounds of how much homework do we give? How much reading do we give? What can really be done in a, in, you know, in a student life that's reasonable? Um, and yet, we are going to demand um, you know, some deep thinking, um, some careful writing, um, some advanced sources that we're looking at. So it's a complicated answer to that. I think the world history will give us a broader spectrum. I think we'll, we really want to sell it to a diverse population of students, um, and after that, we'll have to get back to you. But I certainly see a, an Amherst Regional High School population that is much more diverse at all of its levels of achievement now than I did 10 years ago. That's my take on it. So Two on. points. The College Board has to approve your family syllabus? Yeah, correct. And then the cost of uh, textbooks. You have a smaller population, large fixed cost, <laughs> higher fixed cost per book, higher price. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Thanks for listening. I assume we're taking it as a group, not individually, right? Um, if that'd be my preference, but at the will of the board. Well, then I'm assuming correctly. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, and also, I, I, if there's any guidance you have, uh, Superintendent, um, I don't know, based on what else we have going on, I just want to make sure we're running late. Yeah. But I'm, I'm cool with it as long as everyone else is cool with it. So I can introduce, this is John Bechtold, Director of Performing Arts and Theater and um, successful director of the show, as I mentioned la uh, last week. So thanks for being here, Mr. Bechtold. Thanks. Congratulations. Thanks so much, um, and thanks for the support. And um, I think it's wonderful. The timing of the show just happened to coincide with uh, a pr course proposal called New Theater Workshop, which is devoted to making new works of theater for students of all stripes. So um, I don't know how much time has been spent uh, looking over the proposal, I try to keep it brief um, 
so we could cut to objectives and a key, uh, several key points of rationale. And then hopefully a question and answer will we'll kind of dig out the rest. So I'll try to front load this as best I can. Um, the core idea here is that while the high school continues to change, and you've heard that already tonight, that we want to create a curriculum that is reflective of our students' interests, that is also preparing them for their future, and is also reflecting the ideals of the school that we want. And one of the things that we know in the performing arts department we care deeply about is putting students through uh, a rigorous experience in the creative process to become makers of things, of experiences, of collaborative efforts, of ensemble work. We believe these skill sets uh, really matter beyond uh, high school, but also have this wonderful bonus of being deeply personal endeavors that also bring out these skills. So the, the commitment that you see students make is always uh, a big part of this work. We also in our department want to continue to foster experiences that are more project-based and put students in the position of making work that they can call their own. And a recent example of this, uh, the last time I was here uh, for a course proposal was to talk about a music production class that's now uh, several years in and is turning out students that are making incredible things that then they put their name on. And we want more work in our department that reflects that. In addition, we also want to make theater specifically something that feels more accessible to our students. I think the common uh, depictions of theater uh, are, are pretty narrow and certainly so for our students. So to offer them exposure to the really wide ranging and exciting world of theater making that's out there that is reflective of so much uh, other work that's happening today feels incredibly rewarding. So that's kind of a, the warm up lap to this. As far as the skill sets and things that we hope for in the course, we want a course where students nine through 12, so they could take it walking in as a first year student or in their last semester of high school, get to join in a class where their job is to make original work. Uh, in a variety of formats, using a variety of conceptual branches and lenses to get there, and create works that also have a large amount of their own value structures and interests intact. Um, doing work like the Laramie Project is, is a great case in point. We just saw approximately 60 students take this deep dive into some very difficult issues and some very challenging questions. And that isn't even to talk about the theater making part of that yet. And the sophistication and the dedication with which they're able to do that is a pretty good full example of the work that we'd like to take on. The problem is that we don't get to offer that kind of experience to all of our students. Certainly it is limited to those that can make a commitment in the extracurricular day. One of our hopes with this course is that we can bring students in in the curricular day that does a few things. One, uh, doesn't make a different demand on their time that not all students can meet outside of school. Secondly, it gives them the opportunity to explore something safely. There is something about having a class in this. Uh, and I see this with my acting and stagecraft classes. The students that venture in there, they're not quite ready to walk out on a stage or into an audition room, but want to see what it's all about. Want to see if something might be here for them. And this course emphasizes that. Last but not least, I think the other thing that's really exciting about this work is that theater can often feel like a prohibitive thing. Well, you need a theater to that. You need a huge budget to make this thing. You'll need to buy the rights to so and so. And so there's this very limited sense of what is possible in theater making. This course is going to intentionally emphasize um, not big tech extravaganzas, but a DIY kind of way of thinking and methodology that allows students to take a situation and a set of materials that they might, they might never have thought of using outside the school and suddenly they're building some sort of exhibit in college or starting a protest that creates the work and uses theater making and street theater as a, as a source for that. Or finding a way to convert, as I've seen, I've gone to two different colleges to see our alums take over their school libraries and convert those big labyrinthine spaces into an immersive theater piece. And this is of their own creation and making. I want to see more of that and I want to get more students into that and that's why this course proposal is here tonight. Great. Anything? Mr. Dunlake. So I, I really liked the, um, the history course that was presented. I, I can't tell you how much I love this course. Like I, I think I'm going to demand that there is school committee representation and to <laughs> allow to be enrolled in this course. So, um, so last spring, um, the theater department put on this, this immersive I, I would call this like surreal improv. Kind of, what was the, the, the name of it? You know, <laughs> Bing right? bong. Bing it's bong. Fun, thank yeah. you. Which was amazing. Uh, all student driven, one on one. Um, you know, immersive audience member. Um, and then this past weekend, I had the opportunity to see the Laramie Project. And 
You know, w without exaggeration, the Laramie Project was the most powerful student performance I've I've ever had the opportunity to experience. It it, it was, it was it was unbelievable how these these students adopted these roles. You know, the the members of Laramie who were being interviewed a couple of years after the the killing of Matthew Shepard, adopting these roles in, in these small spaces with with the audience. Then you'd move from space to space, and then you you'd be there in the emergency room when. When, when he arrived there, you would be there at the press conference, and then, and then at the funeral, and then in the trial, and then it was this build, and, and, and all throughout, there were, there were the, 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 the images of, of, of the fence and the, and the, the, the evocative um, media coverage. You know, it was so powerful. I mean, I'm, I'm getting a little choked up just talking about it, and then to, I was talking to Mr. Sullivan. Yeah, you cry. Uh, yeah <laughs> a, about a little, a little later. It was, it was only sort of after this, 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 Intense experience that you, you wanted everybody on the planet to to feel. It's like, it's like when you, um, you know, I remember the, the first time that I saw a documentary on the Holocaust, and I was very young. And I, just, I wa walked out of it thinking every human being needs to experience this. It was like that, and then to realize that these are high school kids. <laughs> these are high school kids that were delivering that experience which was was unbelievable. So so take that, and then have Bing Bong. <laughs> just showed, shows me the incredible dynamic range of, of what has already been able to be accomplished. So, so to take that potential, right, of the students that are already creating this and the, the staff that are already so dedicated to supporting that, to be able to e broaden that accessibility to, to, and to empower students with that level of creative expression is just such an amazing <coughs> idea. So I, I just want to thank you for bringing this idea forward and your, and your continued um, initiative to, to, to bring that to more students. Well, there's a counter thank you here, of course, too. A lot of this work and research that went into this proposal is a result of my sabbatical last year. So thank you in turn. Ms. Mayor? Uh, just a clarification. The students didn't write the Larry Project, did they? No, they did not. What they did is took a play that was designed for 10 actors on a bare stage and converted into a play for 40 actors across the school. So they did somewhat rewrite it. Absolutely. Okay. Um, the adaptation was is a critical part of that work. Okay. How does, I'm curious, um, uh, by the way, of course, your work, the student's work is impressive, so, it, you know, <laughs> I was blowing past that, just because it's, it's uh, you know, it's very impressive. Um, so how does this fit with uh, sort of like a program of study or a, or a, what's the concept around how this fits with what a student might experience either through after school's uh, activity, but also within the regular coursework? That's a great question because it brings to bear the, the weird place that, that theater exists in the school, which is in this model that is kind of a hybrid, is both curricular and extracurricular, yeah. and those two you know, dovetail with each other. So all the major productions that we do, and we do about six or seven a year, are all extracurricular productions. That is the time and resources spent are all out of school. And of course, like this is curricular during the day. The overlap is uh, a few different things. One, it is sometimes these courses, and I would speak to any of the theater courses because I could see evidence there, which is why I feel like I can be supportive in, in what I'd speak to here, uh, that it serves as a bridge into those uh, productions for students who would never otherwise find their way there. So that's an important first factor. But secondly, these courses are also meant to be ends to themselves, especially a course like this. They're meant to leave with a discrete set of skills. So this could very much be for the student that really has no fundamental interest in theater as an art form, but understands that the tools that they're being given can be used to really build something that might vaguely be called theater, but has so much practical application beyond. Um, so I want to draw students that don't see themselves as theater kids, and that's much easier in a curricular format than it is in an extracurricular format, um, where you get to preach the choir a little bit more, or at least roping kids uh, that you only get to a certain level with. So I think those are two key things. And I think the third key thing is that um, we get to make a statement as a school about the kind of work that we value when we put a course like this in, into our curriculum. And that is heard by students, and it's heard by our community, um, that there is a way of taking something that could otherwise sound like just art for art's sake, mm -hmm. and realize that we are sending out students in the world that are equipped and prepared to go through a process, not just to an analyze the world around them, but to synthesize things and respond to it. And a course like this can offer that. And is there another, uh, is it, so another question would be is, um, when, I think it's wonderful to have uh, students generating their own material, their own experiences. It then naturally raises the question for me about how that changes their experience and relates to um, 
written material that's out there. I mean, it's like source work that would be within the, typically within an English department or something, where they're reading it almost as literature, but in fact it really isn't. It's actually theater. I mean, Shakespeare is the obvious one. But I mean, sure. There's lots of it. Absolutely, and it, it is exciting because when you get involved as a creator in something, your research or your investment in those kinds of materials has both a very practical application, you need to understand it so you can use it formally, but you also develop this personal attachment to it. Again, I can point to the Laramie Project. We received uh, a raft of materials from the Matthew Shepard Foundation, primary sources of all shapes and sizes, from transcripts to letters to news reports to videos to audio recordings to letters to the family. And we got to pick and sort through those. And if anyone was just standing back and looking with you know, an educator's lens, they would have loved to have called that their classroom. Mm. Um, here, we were just trying to get some work done. <laughs> Thanks. Anything else? I'm just curious, how many, you know, that music class that you introduced, that was for about 10 students. How many students? Uh, 15. Oh, 15, yeah. sorry. Yeah. And how many would be in this class? Well, the average class size for <laughs> acting or stagecraft is in the low 20s, so I would suspect to be around there. There's certainly no limit in terms of tech or physical materials to hold them back to something like computer keyboards or something. Yeah. Just a quick question. Um, I mean, I, I find all this absolutely fascinating. I have to ask if there, uh, does this become an additive mm. uh, course, or is this something that pushes something else out of the way, and if so, what might that be? No, that, that's, that's a great question to ask. Um, my suspicion is that it's not an additive course. Um, the most likely scenario is that I teach multiple sections of acting one, for instance. I'd say the most likely end of stagecraft. Probably one of those sections is pushed aside while we make room for this. That, I call that the most likely situation. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And last but not least, our uh, math department chair. Uh, yeah. Isn't this statistics? <laughs> AP statistics, <laughs> yes. This is like uh, one of the most yes. important subjects like anywhere. The most important I skills totally to have. I totally agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> so if Jane, you can take it away. Um, so uh, we have been planning this for a really long time. Um, we, sorry, this is like the math department, I should say. Um, years ago, we implemented um, Statistics 2, which made our stati statistics course a full year course because we, um, in our old uh, curriculum, we didn't have any statistics. So we, we knew how important it was and we wanted to make sure students had access to it. It wasn't a perfect model, but um, it at least gave students an avenue to get some statistics education before they went to college. So when we were doing that, we were looking forward to um, after we integrated statistics and probability into our curriculum to move to the AP stats course. So we're ready. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is not an add-on. It is um, taking our honors, Statistics 1 and 2, and changing it into an AP course. The students are ready for it. They're um, right now almost doing everything in the AP course, so I think it's important that we um, give it that label, and it, you know, it's up to them whether they want to take the exam or not at the end and skip over a course in college. Um, so we also have... Um, we want to keep our college prep course in statistics because those students also should have access to it, but they don't, they don't always move as quickly through the curriculum. They're 11th and 12th graders, so math education at that juncture has kind of, um, students are at many, many different levels. So that's why we want to offer the, the um, two different courses. Um, so there would be slight adjustments to our current course that we have now. Um, we, I looked at the syllabus that is on the College Board that um, I know Mr. Lutz referred to, and we saw that we'd have to make some minor changes. I'm working also with uh, someone who's currently on our staff who taught AP statistics elsewhere, um, and she's currently teaching the Honors and College Prep statistics course right now, so she's like, they're ready. <laughs> Um, so we wouldn't be pulling kids from um, necessarily other courses because they're already taking honors. So I don't, I don't feel like um, that's an issue. Access, um, it increases access for um, 
a student to have a math AP course because right now we currently offer AP BC calculus and AP AB calculus but not every student in high school gets prepared to take a calculus course in high school so what this would allow students who are in our um, college prep track after their junior year if they reached integrated four then their senior year they could have access to the AP statistics course so it would, it would open that up for our students um, I'm going to just are, kind of there, stop here for a sec. Are there questions? So cute. No questions. It's not as fascinating as we're I'm really sorry. Hard <laughs> <laughs> drama. I should have brought is, graphs is for you. <laughs> I have to say, I actually, uh, this is another class that I wish I had been able to take when I was in high school because when I found myself in college, uh, yeah. Casting about trying to figure out as a liberal arts major what I you know what ma math could speak to me and, and provide mm -hmm. you know both the requirements and help me with my work. Statistics was where I ended up, mm -hmm. and nice. I had no basis for it. And so um, you know it's just a shortcoming of my my education. But I do really uh, appreciate all the work that's gone into this. I think it's absolutely spectacular. I have that's why I have no questions about this because I think it makes perfect sense and uh, fully support this idea. Thank you. I fell in love with statistics in college myself, <laughs> <laughs> and carried it forward to grad school. When I was really loved it. So it is, it is, it is, was sincerely meant. Although I was trying to counterbalance the excitement around uh, acting in theater. Thank you for doing that. Uh, no, so I have a similar reaction to Sir Johnny's, which is, you know, it, this is straightforward, um, and, and I think it really actually hits a, a, a need right now in in, uh, in careers in the workplace. I mean, not to get too mm -hmm. an analytical about about uh, what. Um, jobs require these days but this this is a this is a very hot skill yeah. you know it's a very hot topic there's a lot of data in the world and you know human beings are trying to figure out what to do with it and how to collect it and analyze it in a professional rigorous way is 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 good and so um, and I, I like how you phrase you know elevating this work that students are already doing at this level of rigor uh, uh, with with the honors um, stats one and two to the AP level um, but you know that this isn't just if you can't handle calculus do stats. It's no, no it's actually it's an AP level course mm -hmm. yep. um, that's as valuable, um, you know, going forward with as many you know career paths and preparation as as calculus. So I um, I, I really like the, the framing of it. Thank you for saying that. Appreciate it. Yes, Mr. Yes, one follow up as somebody who's um, taught at some level statistics myself. Um, I know. Calculus is the basis for a lot of this. So, is this? The, but this would be something that you'd either take cal like pre calculus, one of your prerequisites. No, this is a non-calculus. Non this is sort of an introductory course, so that when engineers go to um, college, they have some basis in probability and statistics, so they can access the calculus. Could based. students take calculus and potentially take statistics, or would they have to choose between one or the other? It's all about schedules, yeah. right? But, 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 but so, potentially yeah, potentially, could. absolutely, I guess you, you could. I mean, we have some students right now who, um, since we have a semester course, um, who take a semester of statistics and then calculus or could something you do like a that. Of the AP? You can't of the AP, but. Um, I haven't run this by my boss yet. Um, <laughs> um, so what we were thinking since it, um, we're only making small tweaks, what we'd like to keep is the option of the Stats 1 honors just for half, for the first half of the year, so that if a student did want to do that, they could access it. Great. Yeah, so I just want to um, thank you. Um, and I just want to say the thing that sort of binds the three courses together, because they're in different disciplines, is that um, all three of the departments have been talking about these courses for, for quite some time, and that process to think through and write course proposals really starts in the spring of last year um, that people are at and, and beyond, but certainly in earnest. Um, and what I appreciate is that it's providing you know rigorous instruction with a focus on access uh, and diversity, and, and that's true in all three of the courses. So when, when I think of common threads, despite the distinct you know areas or disciplines, I think that's offering um, new and exciting choices for our high school students. It's the, for me, the common thread that's the most important, that we want to give our students broad access, that it's um, diversifying our course catalog. Um, we know 
these seats will be filled, um, and we know the students will do high-quality learning that's going to advance them and whatever they choose to do beyond. So I really thank all three of them. And it's not crowding out other courses, as we've described, and um, you have the money to pay for it without looking for additional budget ads for this year. Yes. I thought I'd just finish the... Yeah, please. <laughs> that's right. Clinch the clinchers for you there. Uh, okay. Are there other, other comments or questions from the committee? Uh, if there is an appetite for a motion to approve the three courses as presented, or any subset thereof, uh, I would entertain the motion. Mr. Nina? I move that we approve three courses as presented. Is there a second for second. that motion? It's moved and seconded. Any further debate or discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by raising your hand. It carries unanimously. Uh, with uh, one absent today, so it's eight to nothing. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Welcome. Thank you. See, that was worth, worth the wait. Totally. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Would I be pressing my luck to ask for a four-minute break? I don't know. What do you guys think? Yeah. We're okay? <laughs> then you get it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a motion approved in Anderson. I can sign it. Yeah, I think that makes sense. <laughs> 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 Microphones are live. <laughs> Open meeting law, right? <laughs> Didn't see the potato chip piece on the. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah? Wasn't there like a federal court uh, oh, I don't judge who <laughs> has declared that secret recordings are now legal yeah. of both police as well as public officials? Did you see? I forwarded you yeah. an email about that this afternoon. Yeah. So, uh, but it's not quite. Its implications for K-12 are a little vaguer than it is for police. <laughs> yeah. Just assuming for school committees, though. It's well, given that. <laughs> we're mic'd up, yeah. More about the venue, actually. All right, we're here. It's another way of saying we're back in, back in our regularly appointed meeting. Uh, next on the agenda is uh, the math and curriculum update. Mm -hmm. Welcome, and uh, welcome to the table. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So I'll just make sure I just do a brief introduction of the topic is that uh, we talked at previous meetings that we wanted to share a curriculum update as well as an update on the math review process and how that was going, knowing that we'll come back and, and they'll share a timeline that this will be, we're coming back, you know, again, this will still be cold and wintry when that happens. Um, but we, we didn't want to wait till we had the math review because it was a topic of interest and we wanted to share the, the work that started, some of the history, because we know people have intersected with this topic at different times, uh, where we are now and where we hope to move to. So um, I'll turn it over to Tim to um, start us off. All right. Thank you. Um, and thank you for having us tonight. Um, as Dr. Morris said, um, the idea is to give you sort of an update um, bring everybody up to speed on specifically the high school math program. Um, and the plan right now is for the consultant who's reviewing grades 6 through 12 uh, to come to your meeting in February. I think it's February 12th. Um, so no snow day on February 12th, please. Um, and, and that'll be a much more in-depth discussion. So... So the, sorry, um, Mr. Sheehan, would you mind reminding, just for people that may be watching, uh, what this consultant is actually supposed to, to do? Right, I actually have that in here a little bit later, yeah. so I'll, I'll, okay. I'll come back around okay. to that, if that's okay. That's fine, that's okay. fine, as long as we have some sort of yes. summary, yeah. Um, all right, so, so the, the sort of agenda for the next few minutes is to go, go back over the timeline, um, because many, if not all of you, have joined the school committee since the time that the high school adopted the IMP math program. Um, and Dr. Gromacki will go over some of the data. Um, Ms. Moody will talk about some a student math survey that was done by the district in June um, and the result of that. And then I'll circle back around with some information about the math program review and the consultant's work and, and our next steps. Uh, so in terms of timeline, um, the high school math department began looking at uh, the curriculum back around 2013. And um, the prior to that time, the math standards had, some change had come about, both from the national professional organizations as well as the state. 
um, and there was a greater emphasis on math practices. And so the department used as their core question which math curriculum best captures and supports the math practice and content standards. And it, you can see up there on the timeline, um, there was professional development around the, the revised standards, and there was a, a pretty um, comprehensive textbook selection process uh, that the department designed and then went through. Um, and the, <coughs> the faculty in the math department worked with professional development staff and textbook salespeople um, engaged in a review process in which they rated um, several textbooks and also made them available to the public uh, for review and comment. Um, and so this was a, quite a lengthy process, uh, certainly before my time in this role, but um, I've been told th since then. And I just included on the next slide some data. It's a little bit hard to see because of the blue background. I apologize for that. Um, around the analysis of the, the four main textbooks that the department looked at. And so the, the uh, table on the left uh, was rating them as far as their rigor, and the table on the right was rating them as far as their responsiveness to the standards for mathematical practice. And uh, the four programs in the, the blue bars were the core plus program, the, that lime green was college prep math, the Red-orange was the Center for Math Education Project, and purple was the Interactive Math Program, or IMP, uh, which you can see came out the, the highest ratings um, on both of those measures. Um, and, and the department was considering what both changes to the SATs, so in terms of college preparation, and also what um, employers are looking at as far as workplace preparation, and so things that were newer to math than when most of us were in school. Um, things like critical thinking and problem solving, communication, both written and oral, um, collaboration and teamwork, uh, modeling, looking for and making use of structures in mathematics, um, and making sense of complex problem solving and perseverance. Um, so it probably sounds very different than what all of you did in high school math. Um, and then the timeline subsequent to that uh, was the uh, sort of a structured implementation of the IMP math program. Uh, and so this is a reminder of the current math courses at Amherst Regional High School um, and AP statistics. Of course, now we can erase the word proposed. Um, thanks to you, it's now an approved course. Um, the ones where you see slashes, like integrated 2H, 3H, 4H, um, it's the integrated 2 and the honors version of that course. Can I amend? Yeah, sorry. Um, we forgot to put one course on there. I Oops. apologize. Um, it's integrated 5 and it's CP, so it sort of um, extends what the integrated 4 would do into the fifth year. Okay. Sorry. It's quite all right. Um, and of course, the high school program of studies, which is on the high school's website, you can read in-depth descriptions of each of those courses. <coughs> um, and then in terms of ongoing work, um, there's a math working group that was formed um, almost two years ago now, and that's actually a K-12 group, um, along with parent representation. Uh, and that group was tasked specifically with looking at um, access to mathematics courses, and that, again, that's K through 12. So are all students able to access uh, mathematic courses, in, including higher level ones? Um, and what kinds of supports are in place? What kind of intervention is in place to support student learning? Um, vertical alignment. Uh, so it, do we have a clear path from kindergarten to high school graduation in terms of learning math? Um, and, and, and the answer to that one is we have work to do on that, and, and that's one of the things that we're hoping the consultant will give us some guidance on. We have some ideas, but it'll, it'll also be helpful to get an outside set of eyes. Um, and professional development for teachers, um, and so the math working group considered all of those things, and, and we've been implementing a good deal of professional development. A lot of it focused on the elementary side, um, and but some a few of our middle and high school teachers have also participated in that. Um, it's it's known as AVMR, uh, which is a, a trademarked name, Advantage Math Recovery, um, and it's something that 
we've invested a lot of time in over the last couple of years, and interestingly enough, a lot of neighboring school districts have now jumped onto that. Um, so, which, which has really been, the teachers who've gone through that training have raved about how it's changed their thinking about how children, how children learn math, how students learn math, um, how they assess math, how they make determinations about how to proceed from where students are. Could I add just very briefly, for those of you who are on the Amher School Committee, about a year and a half ago, there was a, maybe a year ago, there was a presentation by the three elementary math, uh, three elementary math coaches around ABR Marin, and that has started at the elementary level, but it's certainly become a more K-12 professional development mm -hmm. and focus, just to jog some people's memories. I thought it was wicked cool. It is. <laughs> yeah. So sorry, sorry, we actually you. have three new cohorts of teachers that have Two have just started the training, another one will start next week, and, and I'm joining in on the third cohort to take that training because it, it's something that's becoming more universal, so I decided that I'd like to jump in and get the training as well. Um, so at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Gramacki to talk about some recent trends in high school math achievement. Yeah, so there's been some data that has been out there around um, MCAS and SATs and PSATs. So we thought it was important for us to really make sure that we looked at the data and felt like we could present that. Um, so the first graph here is the MCAS data from 2013 to 2018. Um, you will see that, that there's a dip in 2017. Um, and if you're just because of all these years, so the first cohort of all IMP students would have taken MCAS in 2017. And then you see in 2018, it actually um, goes up to 88, so 86, 83, 88. And then the number of needs improvement and failing is at 13, which actually, again, went down, as you would expect. Um, so we've received a lot of questions about SAT scores and, and kind of how things are trending. So what we did is we put um, <laughs> the data up here, but it's really important to note, and, our and I worked closely with the college counselor around this data, is that the test changed in 2016, and so it's very hard to compare the two scores, but nonetheless we do have the three years of data, and so you'll see that um, the, the ARHS average compared to the state average. Um, there is a smaller gap in some places, um, but what we're not seeing is, is some kind of you know, plummeting scores or, or scores that are, that are dramatically decreasing. And at the same time, I don't think we're comfortable saying that this is the best metric to use to evaluate our math program, but the fact that, the, that people are talking about this data, we thought that we would bring it to you so that we had some clarity. Well, there was a letter to the committee. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. Uh, so the next set is um, with the concordance table. So this is an attempt to try to um, convert the scores from the new test and the old test to try and have some kind of um, consistency so that you can see the change. Um, I, we just caution that, that this shouldn't be used for longitudinal data or research, but it, it, it's an effort to try and, and um, show the trend in the pattern. Could you yeah. describe what a concordance table is? Yeah, it just takes, it because the test is different and the scores are different, I know Myra Ross, the college counselor, you know, reminded us that in 2015 the top score was 760, it wasn't 800, and so this is an attempt to see what it would look like if you had the same scores across all six years. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. so, a, so the ACT, this is interesting. I actually would have thought more students took the ACT today. I feel like we get a lot of requests for ACT. And in 2013, we had 112 students take the ACT. And in 2018, we only had 68. Mm -hmm. So that's just not a, I wouldn't have predicted that. Um, we also know that a lot of colleges are going test optional. And so Myra's been talking mm -hmm. to students a lot. When I say Myra, the college counselor, Ms. Ross, she's been talking a lot about the fact that a lot of colleges aren't using that. That's not to say that we don't still encourage our students to take them and so forth, but, but more and more students or colleges each year are, are um, going test optional. But so for the ACT, again, we tried to look over the past six years um, to determine you know, if, we're, if we're seeing huge um, variances. And the last one, um, there's also been some talk about the PSAT. 
So there's, there's something about the cloud and how they're managing their data at the College Board for PSAT. So we did not have access to state data for the PSAT, but our um, scores just came in for 2018. So we actually took the 178 students who took it and then we just um, averaged that and got the mean. So that's the 561. So again, if you're only looking at years 2016 and 17, there definitely was a decline. I don't know that we can say exactly what, why, or, or what. Um, Myra also, because she's been here for many, many years, said that it's not uncommon that if you actually look over the past 15 years, there are definitely places where you see dips. She said, you know, some classes are stronger than others, and there's just a lot of variables. So if you're only looking at 16, 17, you could start to be concerned that, that there is a dip. Um, but again, this is PSAT. These are the 11th grade scores. and. Um, and then we also have our 10th grade SAT, PSAT scores too, where we're not yet, you know, we're not seeing any kind of large, it's looking very similar to this. But for 10th grade, we have to remember that they, did, they actually don't have access to a lot of the math yet that they will have by 11th grade. So these are the scores as reported, and um, Tim, who did these slides, um, sourced each data point just back so that we know where those, where those scores came from. Mr. Medina? If you were looking for metrics to measure the success of a new program, what would those metrics be? Well, that's why we had an outside consultant come in <laughs> and really, well, so what we wanted to is we, want, we really wanted the student feedback piece because what we heard in January when we had the coffee with the families was talk to the students, listen to their experience, and that's that qualitative data piece that we can't ignore, and I know that Ms. Moody will speak to that. So we had over... 550 responses where students, some of them wrote pages about their experience. So that, so, so I think that's important. And we have the, the scores, how the students are, are doing in the courses. And again, I don't think we're putting this up here to advocate one way or the other. We're just trying mm -hmm. to say this is the data that, mm -hmm. that we have. Okay. Mr. Donis? So um, thank you for this. I think it's really mm -hmm. helpful and informative. Um, one comment that I think that you just made before we were looking at the SAT 2013 to 2018 chart, mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned the gap is decreasing between the high school and the state level. And I just, looking at the numbers a little more closely, it looks like the state numbers are going up, uh, which is great, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that you know shows some sort of upward movement on that. Uh, but our numbers are also increasing. So. I guess there's been, you know, the state appears to be improving, at least from this, what this chart is showing. I don't know if that's mm -hmm. accurate. Um, and, you know, perhaps accelerating at a, at a much <coughs> rate. I don't know what, what's happening across the state. Again, I think it's fantastic. Um, but our numbers are still increasing. Is that is that correct? Because it looks here like there's still steady growth from 2013 to 2018. We started at 585 and now we're at 620. In the SAT. SAT, SAT yeah, it's yeah. page five of this uh, handout. Mm -hmm. yep. And SAT is really hard because it's not a required test. And so I thought you might ask about participation. So, for example, the PSAT, um, we started offering in the high school during the school day, which is different than the way it used to be offered, which was on Saturdays. You had to get here early in the morning on a Saturday. So we're, we now have 77%, last year it was 78 percent of the students actually taking it. Um, where in 2013, and we were a much larger school, but um, we only had 67 percent of the students taking it. So we actually increased participation, which again, one could say is another variable. Mr. Um, so yeah, so thank, thank you for this. Um, so just because, like you mentioned, there is some data out there with, you know, people drawing different conclusions. Um, is, is there any, so when you've poured over this data, all the, the different ways to look at and present MCAS and PSATs and SATs, I mean, you know, there's different ways that you can say present um, data, a data trend if you want to show a line going up or down, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I'm, you're only going to show the advanced, or you're only going to show advanced and proficient, or you're only going to show it for these three years. Is it, so um, all that being said, knowing that this is a, a, a only one and not the, the biggest and most important part of the math evaluation picture. Is there anything at all in any of those data sets where you looked at and said, huh, there, that is maybe something that, that is concerning to you? Like, I just, I just kind of want to get your sense of, since you've spent a lot more time with the data than, than we have, you know, if there's anything that concerned you from, a, from mm -hmm. that kind of standpoint. Uh, we did actually look at the, the MCAS scores we put up there 
we grouped in the way that they're typically looked at by school districts. Um, and so we group the advanced and the proficient together and the needs improvement and failing together because that's typically how school districts look at it. But I did break them down um, into the four separate groups. Um, and, and we did, in fact, find that the advanced group has declined a little bit. And, it's, and I can show you. Called this up just in case that question came up. <laughs> <laughs> I, it on the now. I was not a plant. Um, and so you can see the the table on the left side. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, you can see what happens there oh, with the advanced, and it does decline, and the proficient starts to go up. Um. So, which is which does bring about some questions, and it's and it it makes me want to drill down a little bit further. So, how many students are going from advanced to proficient? But with that proficient going up, how many students are going from needs improvement to proficient? What are the the sort of questions there? Um, and it's and there could be a lot of other questions. Are we at this point serving our students who sort of represent that middle range better than we did in the past? At the, um, at the expense of some of the students who are at the advanced range, I think that's an important question, um, and, and there's certainly others, um, and it's and, and to sort of get down that far, you have to sort of go to the student level of the data and work with the high school faculty who know the students better to say, all right, which students are falling yeah. into these categories? I just just because you know. Part of my job is I, I do a lot of data analysis, mm -hmm. and so yep. you know. So like one one thing I think is also important uh, when trying to interpret the story here is that it, you know, like a data trend like this when you're looking at one, you know, two data points mm -hmm. and you're trying to interpolate a, a trend, you know, our, the human mind has such a need to draw a meaning and conclusion. Uh -huh. You know, we want to classify, right? And so especially. Especially a line, especially a colored line. It's, 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 it's no, I'm literally, you know, I can talk about data vis fit theory all day. But um, it, it wants to draw a conclusion, you know? And so I think in, in this case, particularly when we're dealing with, with small number variances, and we're talking about less than 20 students, like uh, going, not that that's not important, but uh, the, the, is the difference between a decline and a, and a flat line over two data points. And so it's, they can be good because it can draw your, your attention into things that you might want to drill down with further, like what's right. the story? And then you go back and you look at well, what that is. But in terms of drawing a broad conclusion, I think the most challenging part about interpreting data is, is not prematurely drawing a conclusion right. and yet honoring that signal and then using that signal for further right. analysis. So, you know, one of the interesting things is you go back to 2011 mm -hmm. and it looks very similar. I was going to say, yeah. Can I have something? Yeah. Just to go to your point oh, yeah, right. around what your conclusions are along. I just wanted to just, um, say how this informs us a little bit more because when we get back the MCAS data, they specifically tell us which questions that the students struggled on. So that's interesting data for us because we can mm -hmm. look at that and then we can make adjustments if we feel like it's necessary or emphasize something to that. So that I feel like that helps us a lot. Move it along. Okay. Oh, um, uh, yeah. Just one. I mean, I was also looking at this and find that really interesting. The the needs improvement line appears to have gone down a little bit as well. I mean, I, you didn't mention that one as mm -hmm. as a concern, and so I'm wondering, is it because you, you know, I, I don't know what that that tells you. I, I mean, I think it's one of those questions that going back to the student level is it, the, did those students move to the proficient level, um, or did some of them move to the failing level, which would be a, a great concern. If they're moving from needs improvement up to proficient, then we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. Um, so I think it raises more questions than answers at this point to consider. Superintendent, it's a very brief point, but it's relevant to that question, which is that one of the things that, that I also <laughs> looked at was the student growth index. So it looks at like the eighth grade students who took the math MCAS in eighth grade. How they do when they're in tenth grade, and did they make above average progress or in, in the middle range? And and so for the most recent year, they were slightly above the the, me, the mean for growth from eighth grade to tenth grade. Because I think the nice thing, and I know there's a lot of critiques of that data source, but it looks at the individual student level and what happened in those two years. Um, so it sort of tries to be a proxy for that question of. Mm -hmm. Well, these change these lines change, but when there's actually individual kids behind them, and what was that growth trajectory from eighth to tenth grade? So it's just another factor, and there's there's more charts you could 
do that you could ever want, but it's just that's one that I use because I think it answers mm -hmm. or no, gives I, some I, information. I, mean, about I think that. that's actually really critical yeah. because when you're talking about this, the challenge is the language you use can obscure the fact of are you talking about the same student's progress over right. time mm -hmm. and what's the impact and trajectory um, versus are there different cohorts moving f mm -hmm. moving through time mm -hmm. and then what happens to those different cohorts and if they do um, I mean just a, there are a lot of things that could happen into any given cohort's life of students that could problematize their experience mm -hmm. when you start talking about different cohorts of students I think it even gets more complex right Oh, absolutely. And so, and so I mean, but just being trying to explain what's really going on. Yeah. Why is this occurring? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Quick question. Um, and I assume that it is, but as you know, I know you did the student survey and as part of this um, review process. Will mm -hmm. teacher feed is teacher feedback being taken into? Like, how is that factoring right. into this? So it, maybe it makes sense if if like Ms. Moody talks about the student survey that the high school did, and then I can sort of bring in the, the teacher piece with what the consultant's doing too, if that's all right. Is that okay? Um, just one more thing about the MCAS. This year they're taking the new test. Yes. So there'll be differences in the data there. Mm -hmm. I, I'm yeah, sure, I'm not sure how the middle, if there was differences in the middle school data. Yeah, it, the thing that is not helpful is when all of the testing organizations decide to change all of their mm -hmm. tests on us, and it like puts an ax right through the longitudinal data, and it's and we've encountered that already below the high school level, and now it's coming for high school um, as the state changes over to the next generation MCAS. Um, so it. it it's a conundrum. It's one that everyone in Massachusetts is going to share, though. And hey, it makes the next section you're going to, the discussion, even more important. That That's right. The, uh, Mr. Menino and then Ms. McDonald. Will the scoring change or just the content? Both. Both. Oh. <laughs> Ms. McDonald. So my question is, is sort of retching back a little bit, back to the, the courses. I, I'm not very familiar at all with the math mm -hmm. curriculum at the high school. Mm -hmm. So, sure. can you help me understand how you go, how somebody progresses through the IMP? How do they get to take calculus okay. if there's already four years of IMP? Uh, right. So. Sure. <laughs> sure. So, um, <coughs> the state standards pushed a lot of the algebra one down into eighth grade. So, when students enter, most students from the eighth grade enter the ninth grade in year two, not year one. We have a um, small cohort of students that enter in year one, which is um, using the same concepts but looking at them in a different way to strengthen those students. So, if you're an integrated two honors in your ninth grade, tenth grade's three honors. Four honors is your junior year, and then your senior year would be calculus or statistics. Thank you. Um, the CP goes out through year five, which by the end of year five, you've completed essentially through pre-calculus. Mm -hmm. And so then you'd be ready to take that. Um, CP. Just col oh, college prep. Yeah. So we have two tracks that go through our school. We also, oh, we also have um, accelerated students, which happens at different levels. So there is a um, course that's offered halfway through the seventh grade year through the eighth grade year, which is um, compatible to our integrated two honors. So we do have some students who come in in the ninth grade and they take integrated three honors, then 10th grade four honors junior year calculus, AP calculus, and then they usually go to Amherst College to take multivariable calculus. And then we have acceleration here also at the high school when they do a summer portfolio of work to advance to the next level course. So, so a lot of stuff going on. <laughs> Look, meeting management is an art, not a science. Um, no, I just, very brief comment. Uh, it's worth sure. noting how rare that is, that uh, our seniors have the opportunity to take multivariable. Mm -hmm. not, not just that they have the opportunity, but to take it at Amherst College, obviously mm -hmm. a, a nationally renowned mm -hmm. yeah. area. So that's it's very it's quite, it's quite the opportunity for a public school to uh, make yes. that up. Thank you. Yes. Um, okay, so. Um, <laughs> sorry. No, no. Um, so, yeah, last year there was a parent meeting here, and parents really wanted us to ask students um, how they were feeling and um, 
So we wanted to collect data around um, their experience, and we wanted to use that data to improve our implementation. So with any good implementation, you really try to um, bring in as much of the community as possible. So teachers, administrators, um, math, math educators, um, math instructors in a lot of cases, um, and then the families who want to bring in and get their ideas. So um, Mr. Jackson. Um, worked with a UMass researcher and um, together they collaborated and put together the survey. Um, we didn't get the survey results until the beginning of this year just because the lateness of um, when the survey happened. So we were, we're, we're really looking to um, inform our work moving forward. We've, you know, we have done a lot of work, pre-work before our implementation. We've had a lot of professional <laughs> development throughout the implementation, but we knew we needed our next steps happening. So um, we wanted it to inform our curriculum and instructional practices. So the following next slides are excerpts from Mr. Jackson's letter home, and I don't know, sorry, I don't have that available. Um, is everybody, we got it. We Is everybody okay? Yeah. Okay, good, good. Okay, so what, um, there are some themes that emerged from them, and so one of them was um, students were felt like there wasn't enough support in the inquiry process. So we've been working um, in our department meetings around this issue. We haven't had that much time, so in January we are planning a um, large professional development during our early release time in our department to work on this specifically, and we will continue to do that throughout um, the year. Um, yep, yeah, that's what I'm going to say about that. <laughs> um, another, another theme that came up are these problems of the week. So in middle school, they have problems of the week. Um, they're a little bit more prescriptive than ours. So what we're trying to do is longitudinally um, develop problem-solving skills. So our problems of the week are a little bit more open-ended, which is uncomfortable, right? You got to figure out a way to get in it, and um, students didn't really see the importance of them. So what we're trying to do is emphasize the importance, talk about because there are pieces of mathematics, mathematical content that are taught in those problems of the week. So that's another piece of it. And then how we're developing their problem solving skills throughout. Um, how, to get, how to make sense of the problem, how to get into it, look for patterns, um, make some sort of generalization, and then finally the ultimate is proving that your solution is the correct solution within the situation. So they work a lot on proof and justification in the problems of the week. Um, Are yes. these problem solving skills assessed in the standardized exams? Um, so the uh, new um, SATs and MCAS have incorporated the pra um, practice standards, and one of them is the problem-solving skills. Um, so we, we've always done this, but I think we've made more of an effort to, set, to really start them in class. Students get traction on them. They, support, they get support on them. So I walked by a classroom today, and there must have been... 40 kids in that one classroom after school today having a POW party. We call them POW parties. And we bring in snacks, and kids work together. They collaborate. They use the board. They talk about them. Um, so trying to create a little more excitement around them. And um, so another piece that came up was um, students wanted more practice. So, and also they weren't, they were hearing, oh, we're, we might not be ready for the standardized test. So we wanted to alleviate um, that stress. But we also know that um, mixed practice is a great idea for learning. So bring, keep bringing back past topics and, and not saying, oh, today we're going to revisit the Pythagorean theorem. It's like, Here's three problems. See if you can remember and we'll support you through them. Because that's how the standardized tests happen. It's just like, here's a problem. You gotta remember your stuff and you gotta apply it. 
So um, we decided to make sure that we did this through SAT questions, um, PSAT questions, and MCAS questions. So sometimes we pick MCAS questions directly related to the topic so they can clearly see, oh, the curriculum is matching the state standard and it makes sense. And other times we mix it up so they are getting the past practice in them. Um, so we'll continue that and we'll get better at it. Um, and we, that's not the only thing we use for additional practice problems. Um, you know, teaching's very organic. So when um, something comes up in your class and you're like, ooh, those kids need some more practice on that, you know, we do make sure that we um, adhere to that and do something for that. Um, so the other pieces were um, around, kind of around the textbook, like, oh, they didn't, you know, the um, objectives aren't aren't right there, there aren't a lot of example problems. So we've always had um, note templates, so we've just made, we've made more of them and we keep getting better at them. And that's for students to have a set of notes in their notebook. They're colored, um, the color is the um, color of the book, so they stand out in their notebook. We also, we've done it for a while, but we, again, we keep referring back to them, the learning targets, so at the beginning of each unit, we give them a sheet with the learning targets on it, and then we keep referring to them throughout their unit. So if we've done a section of inquiry learning, we've done the notes, we can say, now how do you feel about that learning target? And they can kind of self-assess on that. Um, we've also um, tests. They felt like they wanted some more review before um, our end of unit tests. So we've made sure that um, we've developed more thorough end of um, unit reviews and practice problems for them. Um, and then we want to make sure that these people have access to these, so we try to make sure they're on our Google Classroom sites. Um, and so oh, I think I have one more, don't I? Well, yep. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Okay. Yep. Sorry. okay. They kind of look the same. Yes. Um, no, that's fine. So just um, how we're implementing the PSAT, SAT, MCAS questions, we either do it as classwork or homework. We make sure that we highlight the content in the IMP so students can see the relationship between what they're learning and what's on the standardized tests. Um, we analyze and talk about them in class. So it's not like just do them for homework, here's the answers. Good luck. You know, we really, we go over them in class and make sure they understand them. Um, you know, and teacher, it may vary from teacher to teacher, but that's generally our um, construct for those types of things. Um, and, yeah, I think that's it. Mr. Dubner? Um, so, yeah, so I have like a sort of a general question about how we help kids transition when they, so once they're done with IMP4 mm -hmm. and then they either go to, I guess it would be calculus or statistics. Mm -hmm. Uh, and making that transition because w one of the themes we, we're sort of hearing uh, like from some of this feedback is um, is, is anxiety or concern right. about um, yep. preparedness for the next step. Um, and so, like, I really like the approach, um, like, overall about uh, sort of a long term mm -hmm. uh, um, approach to you know, continuous improvement. Um, so, I'm, I'm just curious about. Um, what, what we might be doing to, to help students like this year because yeah, sure. like when I think about the, the spring 18 survey one thing it doesn't catch is that cohort mm -hmm. that had just finished up IMP4 right. and yeah. that is right now right. in whatever course and, and it's yeah. funny like um, I find this an in interesting problem um, that we encounter a lot of this type on school committee where we get anecdotal um, feedback and evidence from email or from talking with parents and I have two kids who gone through the high school or, or I'm sorry, two kids who are currently in the high school. Uh, they wish they had gone through the high school. Um, uh, who, you know, interface with IMP at different points. Um, I remember working with um, Ian Stith six, year, right. six years ago, the very beginning of Math Flex, right? And we were talking about this cohort of 2019 that's mm -hmm. now arrived at senior year. And so, um, so as we're doing this long-term planning, sort of wondering about those, those kind of supports. Yeah. So, um, I'm teaching calculus this year, so I have some of those <laughs> students. Um, and a lot of it is around anxiety. So um, I've taught calculus before IMP. 
So those students also had anxiety. Some of it's just a different type of anxiety. So we used to give a, um, a, a summer assignment where it was like jam-packed, go back, learn all these skills, be ready for calculus, and um, they'd come in and they'd be given a quiz and then they would completely bomb it and it would not be a good situation. So, um, so that's happened before, so we're well aware of that. Um, what we've done is um, made adjustments to our year four for the next cohort. So when they come, it's not so much that um, we need to teach new stuff. It's just making sure it's fresh in their mind for, for when they transition into calculus. So the cohort that we're working with right now, we're just making sure that we, you know, teachers are after school. We are, um, the AP um, College Board always suggests that instead of reviewing everything up front, even though every calculus textbook, or a lot of them, have the review up front, the first chapter, what they really recommend is review as things come up. So we're really trying to make sure that we're doing that, and I know we can get better at that. So that's sort of where we're at right now with um, the transition for those students. I don't know, I just said a lot today. I hope it made sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, so I appreciate you asking the, the hard questions with this. I think um, what I'm hearing is, you know, a, a willingness to understand where things might be going wrong mm -hmm. um, and not just assuming that it's all going to be hunky-dory right. and mm -hmm. flowers mm -hmm. and unicorns. Um, <laughs> I, I do wonder if you know, maybe you already have access to this and we, we haven't heard of that or maybe we, we need to do it together, is just to reach out to other uh, communities and other districts that have already done IMP, maybe for longer, um, mm -hmm. and to see if there is, you know, uh, if, if anyone has been tracking progress for students who are going into college and, mm -hmm. you know, kind of what that looks like coming back. Not that I think that that is a perfect translation mm -hmm. to what would happen here in Amherst, um, or at our region, but I do think that that might provide maybe some more information or more context anyway, um, because, you know, I, I think that all of that can also help our learning, right, and just to understand if there are, when this consultant comes back, you know, in, in the early spring or late winter and provides us with more, you know, uh, point of input, I guess, for us to use and corrections that we can make. Um, It'd be great to be able to compare that to other places that have also been doing similar kinds of work, right? Just to understand, you know, are we are sort of an outlier? Are we kind of in the middle? Or are we, you know, sort of falling behind, right? Um, and I think that this is just good practice, generally speaking, mm -hmm. right? For you know, for all Absolutely. sorts of uh, educational mm -hmm. practice, but especially with something like this, where there is maybe some a crisis of confidence potentially, mm -hmm. or you know, if people are feeling really insecure, students, families, in the community. Um, it might be helpful to hear other, you know, sort of where mm -hmm. we are in relation to others. Can I, can I uh, tack on a related question then or point would be, uh, what was, what is or what was the peer learning that went into uh, adopting this curriculum? What was it? Yeah, and what is it ongoing? In other words, in other words, we're not alone and there's got to be, I mean, and also particularly Unless I'm wrong, uh, the the materials we were given earlier identified this is also an outgrowth of uh, changing, uh, you know, National Common Core standards mm -hmm. and approaches to 21st century skills, which me which sets a context, uh, you know, particularly with the the in increase in emphasis on uh, critical thinking and problem solving and things mm -hmm. like that. That this is. This absolutely isn't happening in isolation. Right. It's happening within a much broader context of districts. And so right. it raises the question of what we can learn from that and what have we learned from that. And that, that would be relevant, obviously, for our district, for our families, for mm -hmm. our practice. A related question, is the adoption of the IMP program a current trend? Are we a leader, a follower? So, um, the original curriculum materials were put out in the late 80s, and they were funded by the National Science Foundation. So they, um, they were started sort of in California, and so they had pockets of places that really used the materials. And then some people 
got rid of it. Some people stayed with it. Um, it was used around here in a couple different schools. So it's kind of been around for a while. This one is the updated one that matches more of the um, Common Core. The only place I know around here that's using it is, um, I think Mohawk just started to adopt it. So, uh, my first question is the the survey was done in June. Mm -hmm. That sounds like the seniors missed it. They did. I think so. Yeah. So that's mm -hmm. kind of a bummer because the seniors in 2015, um, 16, sorry, they were the, they were thrown into IMP as sophomores. They didn't mm -hmm. have it as freshmen. But they had it as sophomores, and yeah. Um, so sorry, I didn't mean to. Yeah, yeah, I know. Sorry, we're having side conversations. So we did have um, a cohort that had algebra one in ninth grade, and then we had phased out geometry, mm -hmm. so that and they went into in, integrated too. Yes. Good. So can I ask? Can I ask you to say that perhaps differently? So of the graduating seniors. Was it the majority of them who who had that experience of entering IMP as sophomores, or was that? Yes. I just want to make sure I'm understanding yes. things clearly. Yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So then, that wasn't by design. Well, that, no, just, that's not. So that's that whole. That. Right. I want to rephrase <laughs> that. It was just it was the students that were in algebra one. So we had students that were in geometry that finished the traditional track out of that same group. Students that came in in ninth grade in Algebra two just finished the traditional track. So there were so, so it was a groups. mixed cohort. It was a what mixed hearing, cohort. Yes. yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's yes. what I, my recollection yep. was, and I'm just making sure I wasn't yep. way off. I'm sorry, Mr. Sullivan. You're right. We, Sullivan, did, you're we did not get that. No. So you missed that whole yes. batch mm -hmm. of students. Yep. And I would like to say that as a parent of a student on an IEP who has both. Um, math and writing um, mm -hmm. issues and anxieties that IMP is not it, it, mm -hmm. the problem of the week is an excellent name for that because that's what it was in my house mm -hmm. was, it was a problem every week mm -hmm. um, I'd also the professional development do you allow the IMP teachers to meet just as a group and like discuss strategies between themselves as they figure, you know, as this, as we get further and further into IMP, are you allowing that group to just discuss among themselves the strategies that they have for teaching? Um, so we've worked closely with the special ed department. Apparently we need to do more work with them. Um, but yeah, we were always talking about it, struggling, trying to figure things out to improve. Um, yeah, so it's not just the IMP, it, I mean, we're all IMP, and we, and we had a math coach also. Who was teaching the courses was, and yep. facilitating that communication, but as with any collaboration in school, we could do more. Mm -hmm. No, I was just curious mm -hmm. if the, yeah. IMP, as the teachers that yes. were doing a lot of the IMP, were they meeting just like in a room by themselves and able to discuss among themselves strategies to help yeah. students mm -hmm. learn. Them. Okay. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the last question I have is, um, are you ensuring that the um, math teachers, if they do give homework, actually look at it and check it and give it back? So um, we do homework in different ways. So sometimes the homework comes in, we don't always collect it and grade it, if that's what you're asking. We do a random sample of that. And what we're looking for is not perfection, we're looking for how well done the homework is. But there's always class discussion, there's always asking students um, questions about the homework as a check for understanding. So. Not, I, I guess I'm, I'm asking mm -hmm. that as a parent yep. who has a child who would spend three hours doing a math homework that someone else would do in 20 minutes on a bus, and then it's not being looked at, and it's not being 
uh, there's no feedback from that amount of time that was spent. Mm -hmm. So I'm, yeah. I'm asking that like as as a math department, you know, all the way through, not just not right. from not just my student. Right. I mean, we do look at the homework, and we do we do walk around. We do give students feedback. We do. Um, you know, do we collect every paper and grade it? We just don't have time to do that. We have, you know, 120 students. Every night we give homework. So, yes, in class we give feedback, but do we write on their paper individual feedback? Only on the ones that we randomly sample. Thank you. Sure. All right. Um, so, to circle back to the, the math program review and the consultant's work, um, th this began as a discussion that Dr. Morris and I actually had going back to late winter last year, um, and, and, and looking at the concerns and looking at the questions and looking at other things sort of anecdotally that, that we had picked up on, and, and it raised some broader questions for us. Um, and so. We had several meetings over the course of late winter and early spring, uh, where it was Dr. Morris and I, um, Mr. Jackson, uh, Dr. Bodie, um, Ms. Moody, and Ms. Thibodeau, who's the uh, math curriculum leader at the middle school, um, and, and also Mr. Blattner, who's the math coach at the high school, to brainstorm questions uh, that we had about our math program. Um, and, and they actually were very interesting discussions, and we came up with an extensive list of questions, a lot of the things that you were asking tonight, as well as many others. Um, and a decision was made to bring in somebody from outside who could look at our math program, um, look at the questions that we had, and give us some advice as far as what we're doing, and, and really to hear about what we're doing well, what we're not doing well. Uh, what are some changes that would make sense that could improve what we're doing for our students? Um, and uh, school districts, including here in Amherst, routinely evaluate their own programs internally. Um, but something that is so complex as this, um, and where there are so many opinions and, and things like that, we thought it best to bring in somebody else um, who would have the ability to, to really take a critical view of things. Um, and then sort of, not to be flipped, but leave town afterwards. Um, so, um, so what we did is I worked to compile all of these questions, got some advice um, from other people in the field as far as putting together a request for written proposals um, from consultants, um, and also got some advice as far as how to get it out there so consultants would take a look at this. And so we followed the, the legal process around that. And um, what we ended up doing was hired Looney Math Consulting. Um, that's Looney. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a memorable name. Um, and uh, they're out of Eastern Massachusetts. Um, and, and it was much like a hiring process for a staff person. We received proposals. Um, we um, had some telephone, so almost interviews with them. I was checking re references with other school districts and uh, with the two different consulting groups that kind of like, met all of our needs, had some really good conversations with curriculum directors, assistant superintendents, and so forth um, as far as moving forward from that point. And so Looney Math Consulting, uh, what they've done is they've done three days of classroom observations, meetings with teachers, meetings with administrators, uh, meetings with families. They um, designed their own student survey, which was given in all of the high school math classes um, in late November, I believe. Um, a parent guardian survey that went out via normal communication channels. Um, and they're undertaking a data review, whatever data they wanted to see from us. Um, and You'll hear more in depth from them when they come back to do their presentation. One thing that I found interesting was that the consultant who did the site visits, um, she made it clear in, in talking to us, she said, I have not looked at any of the data and I will not look at any data until I've seen what's going on in the schools. And her counterpart was reviewing data at the same time. Um, so she wasn't going to be sort of 
blinded by any of the numbers she saw. And, and, and it was amazing to me. I sort of put together the schedule of classrooms to visit, and, and she managed to see, I, I think, virtually everybody who teaches math from grades 6 through 12 um, over a three-day period, which is nothing short of impressive, <laughs> um, um, including Pelham School. Um, and, and the reason for including grade 6, I should clarify this, is because it, grade 6 is typically a middle school grade. Um, in our community, it resides in the elementary schools, but math textbooks, math curriculum is almost always, when you look at it, at 6 to 8 and 9 through 12. So it was important to include that, and in fact our 6th grades use a, a middle school math curriculum. Um, and so they're looking at vertical alignment, they're looking at inclusion practices, student access, um, options for um, intervention and support. They, the classroom observations were to um, take a look at our instructional practices, um, questions of, in, in terms of individual teacher practices, because of course that's always a question that comes up when you're looking at a curriculum. Um, how much fidelity do you have to that curriculum because that can affect what's what the outcomes are uh, and so we're anticipating your February 12th meeting to have um, a presentation from the consultants and they'll be able to be here and present and take questions from you at that time did the consultant have clients with also adopted the CIMP program um, that's a good question. It's not something I ask them directly, um, but but it, it's it's a good question. I can I can ask them that. Um, and it, and I should mention this actually came up. I thought of it as we were talking that um, IMP is is one program of these integrated math programs. There are other names for them. It's sort of like we use IMP. That's like the Kleenexes to tissues. Um, so it, it's important to note that like Northampton doesn't use IMP, but they do use an integrated math program. Have they ever worked with a different brand of tissue? The the <laughs> consultant. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That that I know is that this. this I figured that was the next logical question. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, and so then, does, is there anticipated the report? Uh, is our district going to be in any way benchmarked against other districts? And, if I don't, and forgive me, uh -huh. I don't mean this like you literally just want to say, this is the way you started out, that if your MCAS scores or whatever, mm -hmm. better or worse than others, and that's the be all and end all. It's, and actually, I'm almost not even really talking about that. I'd almost actually say, what are we, in year three? Four? Year four. Yeah, year four. If we're in year four, okay. If, uh, I would love to know if every other district that, that mm -hmm. implemented whatever form of Kleenex this is uh, uh, found out that in year three and four, uh, 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 parents got upset, mm -hmm. <laughs> and basically, and they did some sort of, and I'm not, I'm not making fun about right, this, I'm right. actually very serious, yeah. is that are there in fact a predictable set of implementation challenges mm. that are consistent across the number of districts? and there are, in fact, responses to that and better and worse ways of doing it. Um, it's, it's not an issue of an excuse. It's about actually contextualizing what continuous improvement would mean, not for the students, but for the staff and the district, right? Mm -hmm. And figuring that out and getting that kind of context. Yes. I, I, I think you uh, probably stated it in a much better way than I did before, but that's exactly what I was getting at mm -hmm. you know, previously, right? And, and so I think that you know, the, the context of what other districts are doing is just important information for all of us to have mm -hmm. in order to be able to right. better assess how successful this program, you know, maybe is or could be, right? Mm -hmm. Because if there's if there's area for improvement, which I hear all of you saying that there it probably is, uh, I would expect that there would be actually, given how young this program is and you know how mm -hmm. we're still learning a lot from it, um, that hearing what other communities have been doing. Right through this process and what challenges they've come up against and all of that is just really helpful mm -hmm. for us, right? It's all, and it's also got to be a way, um, within, within the context of a shared objective to optimize the mm -hmm. program as best possible and improve outcomes across the board, all different grades, it's also a way of being able to communicate um, that, well, I guess I'd say two different ways. Analytically, 
you'd find out whether there is something unique about our district. Mm -hmm. And if we were now, I'm saying seriously, I'm just saying mm -hmm. objectively, mm -hmm. is if the report came back in February and said there's certain elements of the program that have implemented far worse than other districts, mm -hmm. um, even though that's not great news, I'd love to know it, and mm -hmm. then we'd love to know how we're going to improve it. If alternately, the answer is we're sort of either in the middle of the pack or maybe even doing better than some districts and the learning and challenges that go on. Um, but here are the kinds of things districts have had to deal with. Here are the kinds of things we see you just dealing with. And here's what the response is. But I think for a lot of people, though, it would have to be comforting to know. Mm -hmm. I think the challenge is if it happens in a vacuum and the only mm -hmm. thing you have to do is compare yourself is, is yourself, right. then um, people are left to sit back and say, uh, well... Mm -hmm. You know, basically they're going to leave with the impression they walked in with. Mm -hmm. If they came in feeling like things were on the right track, they're going to say, awesome. And if they came in feeling unsettled, they say, that only makes me feel a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, anyways, right. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. So I, I would anticipate that, that some of what they talk to us about will be from some comparison of districts. Um, and, it, and, and I think you made a good point um, that's... That, it's a problem in, in this profession in general, sort of isolation by, by where you're located. Um, so I would anticipate because they do have this sort of broader view that that's going to come into it. Um, but it's something I made a note of it that I can check in with the consultants about as well. Great. So then in, in terms of next steps, um, we'll have the, the results of the math program review, um, which will then lead us to say, all right, what do we do now? Um, and, and this is something I, I met with the, the math department faculty uh, about a month ago as this was getting underway. And that was, we sort of had that discussion. And, and teachers rightfully were very direct. They said, all right, what's going to happen with this report? And are we going to be included in it? And, and my feeling is absolutely, um, because it's, it will be the, the math department faculty grade 6 through 12 that are going to be crucial to where we go with that and, and how we implement recommendations and how we choose which recommendations to implement now and which ones to, to sort of look at over time um, to develop a plan for, I mean, things that might be minor adjustments, things that might be bigger changes. Um, and because we're looking at half of our school district, grades 6 through 12, I imagine there'll be a combination of, of the two. Um, and then a continued on-journal evaluation, um, continuing to ask these questions, because as we implement any kind of adjustments, we're going to need to circle back and see if they've had a positive result. Um, and is there more training that we need? Are there other components to the curriculum that need adjusting over time? That's good. Question. I'm so used to someone else asking first. Um, is this something that that likely whatever you learn is close enough to budget neutral that you don't need to plan in any resources for support next year? I can. I'll take that one. Mm -hmm. So I know. Um, so the way our budget process works, I'm gonna. This it, it'll take 90 seconds, but it's worth I think the 90 seconds. Okay. Um, is that um, our building administrators share with Mr. Magano and myself and Ms. Cunningham their requested ads and cuts, and I. I'll be honest, we don't get many administrators recommending cuts um, before they see numbers. We always have like, you we know. You always leave them the option. Yeah, like we'd yeah. bake for, if that happened, just put it out there at 930. But, um, <laughs> but um, and so there is a, a request that's an internal, I, I'm going to answer it directly even though it's an internal request mm -hmm. of having a placeholder for whatever results from the, the math review. Um, you know, then goes feeds into our larger budget process. But you know, Ms. G Dr. Gramacki did include uh, a placeholder for that. You know, because we want to keep an eye on it. Not that we know actually how much money would be needed or what would be needed, um, but she was thoughtful and. I think well, I wasn't looking that. for like the big reveal. Yeah. But um, I would be upset if you didn't put a placeholder mm -hmm. in. Yeah. Because I mean, if everything ends up being free, I mean, right. being free meaning no revenue neutral, and right. no, uh, but no budgetary impact. That's an awesome problem to have, but when does that ever happen, right? I mean, at least there's like a workshop that needs to happen or yeah. something, right? right. right. It costs a couple thousand bucks. Yeah. Anyways, so I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Mr. Gilman. Yes, yeah, so I, I didn't want to leave this discussion without saying that, like, I, I actually talked to a number of kids who are thriving and enjoy IMP. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, and I, I, I think one of the, the issues we struggle with at school committee is that uh, our, there's a natural selection bias in the anecdotes that come mm -hmm. to us mm -hmm. that... Uh, skews to the negative. Mm -hmm. We don't get a lot of people saying, 
hey, I really like what's going on. I have nothing to tell you. <laughs> you know, we get so you know, and, and but that's okay because mm -hmm. we we embrace the process of, of continuous improvement. Um, you know, but you know, so I wanted to say that, and and just just that I think it's important to um, to to be responsive as much as we can to the resources that we have. Uh, to support the kids that are currently in the pipeline, you know, this this school year, and be and be supportive of teachers. I can imagine from from the perspective of a teacher who's gone through this level of change, mm -hmm. and then being told, you know, at the end of last spring, hey, do these five or six things because yes. parents are complaining and you need to make IMP work. You know, that could be a little overwhelming. And I can imagine mm -hmm. there being maybe a range of comfort level uh, mm -hmm. from teacher to teacher, depending mm -hmm. on how the implementation mm -hmm. went about how, about managing that, what, whether in the IMP pipeline or in classes after that. So. Um, you know, resources are always finite, but you know, do, being able to be responsive to that this year, I think, would also be, mm -hmm. be important. Superintendent. Yeah, I think just on that note, and, and Mr. Sheehan talked about this a little earlier, is um, Mr. Sheehan was very intentional, and I think we were very intentional collectively, the people who were sitting up here, of trying to make sure that the review process felt authentic, <laughs> it was honest, but that teachers were an active part of that process. Mm -hmm. There, there's, right, there's lots of bad examples of review processes where the people who are closest to the work somehow are um, the subject to the review. They're not actually a part of the review. And I think that the firm that, that was chosen is, is had a very holistic viewpoint that not that they're, everyone's going to love what they say, but that everyone's input was really authentically seeked um, and gathered as part of the mm -hmm. review. Because I think it re the process part really matters. However you feel about the outcome, mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. you weren't part of that process or don't perceive that you were part of that process or classrooms weren't visited in the way, right, th that has a really different outcome you know, how people will feel about the outcome, I think, is markedly different. Can I just say one thing? Mm -hmm. um, I would be um, negligent if I didn't say how um, dedicated the math department is to uh, mm -hmm. A-plus um, math education here at the high school. And they've been working since, the you know, 2013, working on this um, to make it better for everybody. And they continue to come in every day and and go at it. So they're imp an imp impressive group of people that are really mm -hmm. working hard to um, give everybody access to a high quality math education. So appreciate your time. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you weren't even first on the agenda. Sure, <laughs> 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 are you last? Stamina. <laughs> <laughs> persistence. Mr. Mungano learned a lot that's of right. education tonight, right? <laughs> Thank you so much, Shane. I thought that was great. This is an incredibly productive meeting. I think it is awesome, though, that um, out of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten items, we've now completed three of them. Yes. I mean, you, you, I'm going to blame you, Mr. Nakajima. You said we were three minutes ahead of schedule about two hours ago. So, uh, On the other hand, you yourself apologized at one point and said, <laughs> I know you want to move the agenda along. That's true. So there you go. I will split the blame. There you go. Uh, okay, Master Building Use Committee Composition. No less important, a little dry. Yes. Hello, everybody. Um, so we hired architects to or you all hired architects to conduct the high school, middle school building use study. Um, it, the architects have asked that we have some sort of committee um, formed to provide them feedback as they form their um, the options and you know, they're going to need just sort of the information uh, uh, addressed back to them on their questions that they wouldn't know. Um, so we put together sort of a sample committee of what it could look like. Um, I'm sure you'll have thoughts on maybe expanding it or um, changing the roles. Um, it is a regional committee, slightly different than the ones we've seen at the elementary level, so we'll probably want to have some sort of representation from all four towns, you know, in, in one of these roles. Um, but this is what we put out there, and I welcome your feedback or thoughts. And if I could add to what Mr. Mangano said, just to, for some committee members who may have been involved in the selection process, um, something that seems analogous, I just want to cut a distinction that this is a building use study. It's not a feasibility study. It's not a building committee. It's a master use, and so it's not looking at huge educational um, implications that might happen after this. This is very much, much more, f it is focused on 
how do we use the buildings we have? What grade levels? Where do kids fit? What would that models look? What would those models look like? So, um, as opposed to some other processes that either have went on or are currently going on in our member communities, this is a little more narrowly. This is more narrowly focused than some of those other efforts. Yeah, it's not looking at renovating the entire building, um, for example. Uh, now there may be some parts that are actually more creative in terms of alternative uses and things like that, um, but in terms of sort of the scope, it's a little more um, refined. Is there anything else? What kind of a commitment do you anticipate meeting from folks? I would say probably at least once a month, okay. um, and it, I think it's going to be a four or five month process uh, by the time it's all said and done. Um, maybe more as they get closer to the end. So a couple hours. Probably once a month yeah or so. yeah. yeah. So is this a, um, it's funny, there are at least some analogies though, to other Absol communities. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Uh, when, when we're thinking of composition and stuff, um, I assume any meeting group we do is a public meeting for the purposes of being public meetings. Yeah, I think we'd want that to but, be. But um, uh, is this like a working group or is it an appointed committee where there are I guess I'm trying to think through quorum issues. Because, mm -hmm. like, for example, most people would say, oh, but wouldn't, I mean, I shouldn't say most people. A reasonable person might say, the more representation, the better. Let's have four parents from each four towns, and mm -hmm. let's have four community members from all four towns. And then all of a sudden you realize you're never having quorum. Sure. Ever. Yep. Like, not even for the first meeting. Um, so do you have any, do you have any guidance? I'm, sure, I'm not trying to yeah. totally joke about this. Do you have any guidance on that? On I'm not sure. I think, I mean, my first impression would be we would treat it like a full committee, so you would want to have quorum of the committee, um, okay. we'll keep minutes, we'll post the meetings and things like that. Um, I think that's the safe way to go. I don't know from a legal perspective if we technically have to do that because this isn't, you know, it's not a full building committee for, like for the MSBA. Um, but I think to be safe and transparent, we probably want to treat it like that. Okay. We will treat it like that, yes. By the way, I'm entirely in favor of that. Yeah, it's no. just with the admonition that, um, yeah. then that the committee is probably under some sort of normative bias against adding too many slots that make it really hard to get quorum. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, I'm still a little unclear as to the actual purpose of the committee. So you have the consultant that's doing the building use study, decidedly not an educational study, although there might be a little bit that has to come up. Um, and so like, what is the committee doing? Is it like an advisory board? Is it is it voting on a set of recommendations? Is it just there to give like feedback in case the consultant needs some information? The, what I've heard from the architect is it's more of a sounding board feedback type of role. Um, much like the elementary feasibility study, this isn't going to result in one option. It's going to result in multiple options and cost ranges and things like that. Um, so what I heard from them is they need more of a sounding board. Like, is this even possible? What are the logistics around this? Um, again, not focused much on education, but there will be some piece of it um, that we set up where they'll meet with staff. Um, Mike. Do you mind if I yeah, add two okay. things? So one is on the quorum issue, Mr. Morgano I spoke already, and when we do advertising to gather these roles, uh, we'd want to talk to the architects beforehand and set the meeting schedule so that people know on the front end. Mm -hmm. So this group's going to meet Thursday afternoons from 4.15 to 5.45. I'm making up that's not actually the real time, but okay. I think that would go, I mean, it's going to eliminate some people from being able to do it because Thursday afternoons is the day that they're off doing whatever, but um, I think one of the challenges that all these groups face is if they're, they don't know both, you know, Mr. Donez's question, how much time commitment is being asked, but also logically when this groups can meet, and architects are working on multiple projects all the time, we know that, and we, you know, the hope is, or the, what we're planning to do is ask them, what's a reasonable meeting time that you can keep consistent, and then as we're communicating to all these groups for membership, being really upfront and honest about this is when this group plans to meet. On the topic that talking about in terms of Mr. Demling's question about what they do, I think, you know, I mean, I think that is most of it, but I think they're, they'd be interested, for instance, if 7 through 12 is being looked at, you know, how do p different stakeholders feel about how, quote unquote, sequestered middle school students need to be from high school students? That's not a large scale academic educational question, but that's something where it's an example of where they would want community input, even at this master plan level. Because um, some schools, some 7 through 12 schools, for instance, are very integrated. Some are, like, literally geographically as separate as possible. Um, so that, not that they're making decisions, but they want to have some level of feedback, and they're not independently making decisions with no community input as a framework. Is it nice? Um, so a couple of thoughts. I mean, I'm wondering if 
we've listed one parent representative. I know you're you know looking for feedback on your sure. yeah, composition, absolutely. right? So you know I'm wondering if it would be beneficial to have both a middle school and a high school parent mm -hmm. uh, represented here. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, I am particularly sensitive to the environment of which we are asking a lot from our community and teachers and others on a lot of building committees, <laughs> and, you know, uh, regionalization questions and all sorts of different things. So I'm wondering if it's possible for us to maybe uh, approach this slightly differently so that we create maybe, you know, two or three opportunities. Uh, and maybe it's, we ask that it's the same people that show up, but we say right off the bat, it's, you know, it's three meetings, the commitment is three meetings. Um, and they come to, you know, those three meetings and there are a set of questions that the, the architects are mm -hmm. proposing. Mm -hmm. And that, that allows for that kind of input yeah. that you just described, um, but it's much more controlled and it's not just this open-ended big yeah. commitment because yeah. It does feel more manageable in some ways. Like you know, you, we've had you know, you think about bringing in like focus groups or people that you bring in for you know for uh, very specific points in time to get their input, but it's not an extended, protracted mm -hmm. process, right? Sure. So I'm wondering if maybe we could do something like that, um, you know, and, and if we articulate it that way, I could see a lot more people being willing to participate in something like that. Can it's I easier add, for us to promote too. Can I add another thing too? Is that um, Unless there's a particular reason why it must be, and I haven't heard one yet, I think I'd call. I, I might even call it like uh, a building use advisory panel or something like mm -hmm. that. And to be honest with you, I would, I would, I would go by open meeting law. I'd have it be totally transparent. I'd publish all the results. I'd do a video if we want to do video, but also dispense with this need to have votes. I mean, because I'm, I'm really. I think once you, because there are two reasons for this. One reason is this is the very, very, very beginning discussions of getting good information around what we might hypothetically, but don't even have any idea, we might do in the future. Once you call out a committee, once it follows quorum and open meeting law, I mean, and by that I don't mean like we wouldn't follow open meeting law. What I'm saying is once it looks like a duck and walks <laughs> like a duck, there are going to be a lot of people who look at this thing and say, oh, so this is the initial group that's making decisions around what, how we're merging the middle, the middle school and the high school, right? right? And so if the actual driving impetus behind this is that the, the, the architects say, boy, we'd really love to have a panel to get feedback from on this that has a composition that in some way reflects the different stakeholders who are involved in this so we can ask them questions, then let's, let's create that for them instead of the other thing, mm -hmm. yeah. along with what she said. Yeah. <laughs> Complimentary, I think. So I like that idea, and this isn't me playing devil's advocate. It's just trying to think through what I think is a really promising idea, which is the other thing they need from, and this is more district staff than it is everyone else, is they need to know enrollment projection. Like, there's, there's some functional logistical things they need. They need to have facilities director walk them around, and they need to do, right? So, so I think the only downside that I can see of having it more as an advisory, like, an, it's more an open advisory, like, I'm imagining, because I like the ideas and the way we're thinking about it, that it would, wouldn't necessarily have to be a set group of people. It could be, here's three opportunities, and maybe there's some people who gather, who are in charge of facilitating that, but we wouldn't close access for people who want to offer feedback, um, but there is some functional logistical things they will need from district staff. And you know, is the committee comfortable with us doing that without having other people around the table? So I just I want to put it out there as so we can at least have that so, level of so By the way, I actually um, I'm happy for these meetings to be open and for broader public stakeholders to be involved. But I wasn't actually saying that. What I was actually saying is I was taking Ben where they would show up and they would provide feedback oh, okay. to this group of designers, but the scope of what they were being asked to do would be more limited, which also might make it easy, both in terms of time commitment, but also in terms of what they're actually being asked to provide. Yeah. And it's still super meaningful. Yeah. Um, and in fact, it's not only more me meaningful, but it's super bounded in the idea that if somebody said, hold on a second, wait a minute, at the end of the summer, I have to like make a vote to decide. We're just like, no, no. See, look, it's not even a committee; it's a panel. Anyways, uh, is it Johnny or Mr. Nolan? Just a quick comment. I mean, I think that um, your 
point, uh, Dr. Morris, about having district staff. I mean, I, I would honestly expect that anyway. I don't yeah. know how the rest of the committee feels, but I think, you know, there's new, multiple projects where you guys are the ones who are advising yeah. new consultants and professionals. So there's certain areas where I actually expect that that would be the role that your, the district staff plays. Right. Your, you know, facilities director who ends up coming in, right? You know, there's going to be roles that, that we can't fill or that the community, frankly, can't probably fill yeah. very easily. Um, you know, so I think from our perspective, from my perspective anyway, I think that that makes a lot of sense. That's helpful. Thank Mr. you. Devin? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if, if the committee and the community can't trust the school administration to provide basic information like mm -hmm. enrollment data and walking through the facilities without it being suspected as something else, then, then we have bigger problems. Or so voted I, on by a committee. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so the, the main comment I want to make is, is I'm 110% with Mr. Nakajima's comment about Let's not dress it up like a duck if it actually isn't meant to be a duck, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I, you know, plus one on not combining the words building and committee in another thing in town. We try to be creative. I mean, <laughs> you look at the name of the committee, it's right? very, you know. So, so, and so I think you can, you know, you, if, if building advisory panel or whatever mm -hmm. it is, and, you know, you can, again, you can make it as open as possible because it's meant to be as open as possible. You can have people sign up to be the seven people that sit at the front of the room, even though the microphone is going to be open for two hours to anybody who wants to say anything they want, right. um, I think is is great. And that that way you That's avoid nice. you know the worst case scenario of people feeling closed off or nobody showing up at all and, and not having a sounding board. So. so what does everyone else think? Does that look good to me? Because you realize the three of us can just keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's not going to help the rest of the committee at all. I cracked myself up. <laughs> um, so I got the feedback on the composition, though. Again, not calling it a committee, but a panel. Does the committee want to vote on it, or do you just want us to form it and send you who we pick? I mean, or do you want to vote on the composition of the panel? Because we'd like to get it formed soon so the, the architects can get going on it. So one, I actually really do want you to take the word building. Mm -hmm. uh, I get, we, I like your the name. We can call it find a something. panel, advisory no, panel. No, but I mean... High, high school, middle school planning study. Well, I, I got the gist of it. Use yeah. pan. <laughs> yep. Anyways, all right. So you're okay without a vote? Just proceed with the feedback. Need a little bit more affirmative conversation from the committee before we do that. <laughs> you gotta actually be able to say something. No yes. vote. <laughs> no I'm vote. Fine okay. With the vote. Okay. You're okay with that? Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, no, that sounds great. I think the one thing we'll follow up on that doesn't need to be decided tonight is that I think having a school committee representative on that is critically important. Yeah. Am I happy to volunteer for that if nobody else wants to do that? Wow. I really, I really enjoyed those interviews with the architect. So. <laughs> did you? That's I did. good. Oh, yes, I'm so see? happy to, to see that, that through. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. Yeah. Great. Thank you. It's a hidden talent. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, we, we've made progress on two things, not just one thing. I know. In this discussion. See, yes. Okay. Uh, in that case, we're going to move on. Um, oh, look at that. Capital process. Our topical. Yes. So... I think this agenda item was just to go over the capital process. Oh, so we right? have a separate item on the roof. I was going to say, is this a euphemism for the roof? And no, it's not. So I think it was more that when we come back in January, I think this is going to be very brief, yeah. um, not just because of the hour, just because it's intended to be brief, that uh, what was a little uh, achronistic was that we presented some capital information at the Fort Town meeting that we hadn't shared at the regional school committee, and it just made sense based on timing. So I think this was an opportunity if the committee had any questions about what was presented at the 410 meeting, which was around the middle school roof, you'd have the opportunity to ask us any questions about where we're going from here or offer any feedback, because that was a different setting than the committee. You mean was. on the capital plan? On overall. the capital, excuse me, not on the operational four towns no, assessment. No, no, no. or even yeah. on the middle school roof, because yes. that's the next item on the agenda. Exactly. Right. Yes, Mr. Uh, so two questions on the roof. Um, one, can you talk a little bit about how that, that three million was arrived at? Mm -hmm. um, like what, what estimate it was based on, if there's any fudge factor folded into that. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, so this kind of came up at Four Towns and I tried to address it, but I don't think I really did it that well. Um, is, you know, so say we put a new roof on the middle school and then at some future date, the region does not uh, need the building any, any longer. I, I would imagine that the, the transfer value or the resale value, for lack of a better term, 
is, is higher with a new roof. Mm -hmm. In other words, there's, there's this idea that we don't want to waste money, right? Yeah. By putting up $3 million of roof on that we're not going to, that the school isn't going to use, and yet there is some sort of asset value to mm -hmm. so Mr. Magana, before you say anything, I literally meant what I said. Are there any questions on the, <laughs> the item we're on is capital process. Is there any question on the capital process before we Sorry. move on to middle school roof? Awesome, there isn't. Can you answer this question? Are we on middle school roof? I'm trying to just. Um, so, just so we have an architect, <laughs> an architectural report um, analysis that pegs the cost of the roof right now at about $2.5 million. Um, Mr. McPherson used a, a different method to estimate the cost of the roof, and he came to about $3 million. Um, so I think the actual amount's going to be somewhere between two point five and three million. Um, what I said at the four time meeting, and I think, is that ultimately what the towns pay for is what the actual cost will be when we get quotes, and we hope it comes in, or when we get bids, and we hope it's much lower um, than both of that, than both of those numbers. Um, but I would say three millions. If you're saying where does that fall in terms of cons on the conservative side, I would say it is on the conservative side um, for the roof. Um, so and, and your second question. I just stay with that. So, oh, so just two additional pieces on that. One is that um, that I know he shared that the work would likely we'd want it to happen while students weren't in the building, and yep. sometimes there can be a surcharge because it, it will take a larger group of empl of workers mm -hmm. to do it in the small, relatively small amount of time we have in the summer. It can be done. Some communities do it, but it has smells, it has noise, and um, you know our recommendation would be not to have it happen while students are um, in the building. And the second part was also that oftentimes with capital projects, because of when they get approved, they happen the summer, not the summer that happens after the vote, but the following summer. Mm -hmm. So he included some escalation clause that, you know, in case we're not able to get the funds in time to get a contract and bid and the work to happen in the summer of 2019, so that work actually happens in the summer of 2020, that that could increase the cost. So he was being conservative with that. But I wanted to add those two specifics. Yeah, uh, and the other thing that... I actually got a really good presentation from students at um, school, I think it was last spring. There may be a push also to put solar on the roof, which is not explicitly included in this cost, but it's just something for the community to be aware of and that we'll probably have to go to the, the towns as well. Um, there could be a push for solar. If we put a brand new, anytime you put a brand new roof on, that's sort of the ideal opportunity to do it. Um, again, we come back to the building use and would you want to put solar on with a 20 year commitment if you don't know you're going to be there for 20 years? So, um, And then your second question, real quick. Bullet, the, just about you put $3 million into the building and right. you don't use it anymore. Yeah, so I think, I mean, in that situation, it's only a complete waste if we knock the building down, which I don't think is really on the table, but I think that's something we can um, ask the architects when they do the building use study because one of the things they're tasked with, tasked with is looking at alternative uses of the middle school. We can try to have them fold that into their analysis of, you know, is there a return on this investment and what, you know, what kind of return that is that if we actually sell the building completely just to another per, um, entity like the town uh, or somebody else. Um, so we can try to get that information from the, the study. Mr. Mangana? Yeah. I thought um, when we did an analysis of the middle school roof, uh, the consultant said that we couldn't put solar on the roof without um, providing some structural support. Yeah, yeah no, that's actually in the, the architect's report, is that to, to, to put solar on this roof, there would be an upcharge in terms of what they estimated at the, the 2.5 number. Um, we have to do structural work to the roof to make it support it. So do you know what that number is? Um, I don't offhand, but I think it was. I think there was a percentage or some sort of estimate in the study. So I'll try to get it for you. I mean, I think. I think if we know there's a conversation that's going to happen, we're better to get in front of it in yeah. terms of what the budgetary impact sure. will look like, regardless of what the committee. I think personally, if we could find a way to do it, and particularly if it reduced operating costs mm -hmm. over the long term. It'd be great to consider it, but sure. you know, it's one thing to consider it if that means our bottom number is three million dollars instead of two and a half, mm -hmm. and then it might be a little higher. It's another thing if you tell us it's going to be five million, and then that becomes all. You know what I mean? Right. Yep. Whole different conversation. Yep. I find it difficult to imagine putting three million dollars into a building and then selling it off as scrap. I mean, it almost. I mean, it's just hard to imagine an alternative use of the middle school. Other, it's built as a school. Uh, Imagine it twice in the same town, right? <laughs> we got two of these things going on. So. We have no choice. Yeah. But it's it just maybe a maintenance expenditure rather than a capital expenditure. Yeah, and I'll just quick update. We did do um, the we f uh, put funds in the budget for patching, like 
higher professional level patching. Um, and we did that uh, last month. And so, so far so good. I think the time we really want to check it is in the spring when things start warming up and expanding. Um, but we're going to keep an eye on that too. I mean, if that stuff works really well, maybe that gives us some more time. Um, and also is a, something we want to look at for Fort River as well. Um, so we'll, we'll keep you no, apprised of that too. Spend the $3 million and it has a short term life. Right. So, so also the middle school agenda item is about the MSBA and um, yeah, we need yeah. to take a vote if we want to sit down. Yeah. Need yeah. That vote tonight. I don't think I don't think this vote will be on the actual submission, but it'll be just do you want us to it could also just be like a confirmation go, like yes, you want us to look into the MSBA. So you want us to vote to tell you to start developing no, paper. No, the vote would be once we vote. come back with a statement <laughs> that of interest. Sounds like a very in the weeds <laughs> vote on our part. I just don't want to be presumptuous. I no, it's good not to be. But can I? I wanted to um, throw something out. Uh, I don't really think it's helpful for our dialogue around the middle school publicly mm -hmm. to be getting radically out in front of all the planning that we'd actually been, should be doing or need to be doing. Um, it's, it's a theoretical construct or exercise that we think in the, in the, while paying down the bond on a, on a roof improvement that the middle school will never be, will not cease at some point in that lifetime, that period of paying off the note, uh, will cease to be used as an educational building. Mm -hmm. um, there's actually no basis right now for making that statement. Mm -hmm. There are a number of hypotheticals that would suggest that it could happen, but then there are counter hypotheticals that say, oh, well maybe we'll move this class in or this, we'll re change enrollment in this way or have this other use. Um, I don't think it does us any good. Sure. The roof needs to be fixed. Um, if we start playing around with decisions that aren't even posed right now, yeah. um, I consider that to be a dangerous place for us to be. And I'm sorry to throw that out. I'm just throwing it out. I mean, I forget who brought it up the other day. Your, your acknowledgement or someone else's acknowledgement that this would be a potential risk is an incredibly useful thing to raise because as, as an issue of towns paying off bonds and all the rest, they need to know that risk, sort of like fiduciary responsibility sure. to have the taxpayers in the towns. So I get mentioning it. But I think if we as a group get caught up and caught away with that conversation, we're doing everyone in our communities a disservice because also it feeds into the note. We just had this conversation about a panel versus a committee around the use of the middle school and the high school. And the entire message we're trying to send is there's absolutely, I mean, we even talked about the possibility that the outcome of the planning study might be that you need to build an addition onto this building to house additional grades. Not that that's definite, but it's possible. Okay. So if that's true, you're talking about an entire another funding, planning, and decision-making process to actually go about building an addition on there, right? Yep. So it's, it's way hypothetical. It's, it's a real risk if you lay out all the risk, potential risks from a financial perspective. But um, I'm, I'm sorry to belabor this. I'm only doing this because rumors begin and then start just like spreading like wildfire on the basis of, well, you know, the school committee was really concerned the other night about whether or not, you know, the middle school would stop using as an educational use, right? I mean, it's yep. sorry to. No, no, I think Then they worry right. about what statistics you have in your desk drawer that you're sharing with the designers. <laughs> <laughs> because then it moves. Anyway, sorry to go off on it. Like, please. Uh, so I, I hear that concern. Yeah. I, I do, however, feel like there's, there's a complementary responsibility that we have on the committee that. We're talking about spending a lot of people's money. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, it's not in a total vacuum that we're just throwing out the possibility that at some future date we might not use the middle school building um, as an educational building. I mean, we're doing a use study of potentially moving the middle school to the high school. So it, it's out there, and, and we have towns. The biggest town in our region has <laughs> serious capital stress. So um, you know, I, I, I think the challenge is, is in correctly framing that discussion and that, um, you know, that, that decisions haven't been made. And, um, but but I, th I think that's the more open, messier way to do it. I mean, when you, when you sort of, you know, parse open, you know, all the things we're considering and you watch how the sausage is made, then there's, there's an increased possibility of misinterpretation, but I think that's just something we have to manage. Is it honest? Yeah, I mean, I was going to say, I think, um, 
I'm, I'm very concerned about rumors, and, and I yeah. actually don't, uh, I don't agree with us going down too far with hypotheticals because I, I do think that that's how the community starts to get signals from us. But I, I guess for me personally, I'm, I'm more interested in the you know potential resale value, as Mr. Dumling had, had previously stated, or the value just generally that mm -hmm. you know making those kinds of inherent uh, improvements to a building bring right because for whatever purpose this building will serve either now or in the you know the short few, in the near term um, it'll need a roof yep. <laughs> and so you know unless again as you know as you said if we're going to planning on demolishing which we're not and you know a building like this of this size would be used in, in many different ways uh, if it were not to be used as a school, which we're not saying, mm -hmm. um, but in any case, I, I do think that you know something like a roof is something that can show immediate need, and if we can find a short-term solution, you know, perhaps for the next year, great. Um, from my perspective, I think we're delaying the inevitable, and I think it's actually better use of our time and the community's money and resources to think about the long term about how we we make those improvements now, so that we don't end up with a bigger problem further down sure. the road. Ms. Pichon. Um, just uh, two things. So, so even if we do the roof, we still have to do the short-term repairs to because it would be a year and a half, basically. Yeah, we'll, we we'll have to monitor this year, but yeah. But are are we discussing whether to look at the roof and include that in the capital plan? Or are we discussing whether we want to apply for MSBA to to bring that cost down? The second piece. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, the specific agenda. I mean, obviously, yeah. we'd only apply if we thought we would do the roof, but. <laughs> in January, or in March, actually, you will vote on the capital plan. So at some point, you will vote, yes, we want to put this project on. Uh, but tonight, it's more, do you want us to apply to the MSBA to see if we can get that cost, hopefully, in half? And, and our roof is a really good candidate. It's 25 years old, 24 years old. Um, so I think we have a strong chance from that perspective of its age. Um, but so, yeah. I, mean, I think I think one of the one of the things that'd be useful. Were you using it? I wasn't. No. Okay, I thought you just want to make sure you weren't. Um, you know. So, I, anyways, I, I uh, to me the number of scenarios in which result in this not being used for any, any educational purpose that the MSBA would um, deem approvable is, I think, really limited. Um, I think. What if you come out with one of those scenarios, then the entire point about transferring an asset that's held by four towns in common to and to and alienate it either to a third party entirely or to one of the subsidiary towns means that you've got to include in the sale price the transaction cost, the cost of the roof. Right? Back that the roof. becomes part. Of, mm -hmm. That becomes part of the purchase price, yeah. which means if effectively the the if you if one wants to push this analysis and figure out what's the underlying risk. What you've really got to figure out is what's the value of the asset, what's the likely it is going to be um, transferable or saleable um, at a price that would allow you to recoup the cost of the, sure. of the debt service on the roof and any other outstanding debt service you have. Okay. And that's, that's the point. But I mean, the risk, is, the risk to the district, the risk to the school district, I don't actually think is super high. Um, because there's, for two reasons, one, I think the number of scenarios you reduce it down to in which it's not actually <coughs> going to be used for an educational purpose that would be subject to reimbursement is pr the, the likelihood of that outcome is, it, there's no reason right now to think it's particularly high. Um, it's certainly possible, but I don't think it's particularly high. The number of other inputs that would go into that decision are substantial, including possibly making other substantial capital improvements elsewhere to do that. And then the third point is, the district would always, in the, in the member towns, would always seek to recoup the cost of, of, uh, of the debt and re recover it mm -hmm. uh, in the transaction. So the question for me would then be, if we're going to bother kicking the tires on this more before um, we look at an MSBA application, is we've got to kick the tires on what will be the process of alienating this asset and recovering the cost of, the, of, the, of any outstanding debt um, that would be acceptable to the towns. And I suppose the issue would be if we think the delta is significantly high enough between what we could essentially charge for the transfer of this asset um, and the increase in the cost of the debt, if that makes an appreciable difference in, in the, the value of the asset, then that becomes a more dubious decision to make, right? Because you're then essentially saying that the district itself would have to make good 
including potentially towns that are no longer enjoying the benefit of the building, mm -hmm. on the remaining debt and what that debt looks like. So if we want to go through that exercise, then we can. I think I'd like to just submit the statement of that interest. <laughs> um, but I think that exercise is the one that, again, I, I think we're going to ask the architects to do. I just don't know if the timing will line up where it's before. So the, so the window for the statement of interest, I believe, is it's going to be released in January, and we'll probably have to submit in February or March, I think. Yeah. Uh, February. Well, um, on some level, we, I mean, we probably, on some level, it would be helpful if they did do that exercise, yeah. simply because this is, this is, the, this is the, the can we keep kicking around yeah, absolutely. Of, of what what does that building end up being if it's not what it is. Yeah. Yeah, we've got, I mean, we've got good numbers on, like, the insured value, but obviously that's not going to translate to what we can sell it for, it's going to probably be much, much less than that. Well, so. it's, I mean, it's what you can sell it for, and then the question is, I don't know how it's governed by law, that if, if one of the underlying member towns wanted to take, essentially, possession and use of the building, mm -hmm. how do you resolve that joint ownership, outstanding debt, and for the member towns, are, is, there, is there a value to the asset that's appreciable, that's bound by law to be compensated? Mm -hmm. Want it? Yeah, so, so I, think what I, heard, question. I think what I heard from all of you is maybe wait to answer those types of questions until after the study um, in terms of getting out in front of this too much. Um, all good questions, but I think we'll keep track of them and try to address them um, once we have the data from the study. So. Are people okay with them preparing their paperwork? Yes. Thank you. Interlocal agreement tips. Good. Um, so this is my last item tonight. So TIPS is, um, it stands for the Interlocal Purchasing System. Uh, it's sort of like a big collaborative that started um, from basically a collaborative in Texas, but it's grown to be um, national. And it's sort of, it's like a state contract. It gives us um, another place we can look to for pricing. So right now we can look to our state contract. We can look to the Mass Higher Ed Consortium. And this would give us a third option for pricing. Um, and so what they do is they do a bid process, they bid out services for um, their members, and then they get prices on those services, and then goods. And so to access them, though, we would have to vote to join them. Um, we're already a member at the elementary level. We joined three or four years ago when we bought cameras for all the school buses. That was a big purchase, and they had a, um, a high-quality vendor that was on their state contract that wasn't on the, or was that, that was on their contract that wasn't on our state contract. Um, and so the things that we'd probably buy from them in the future would be things, pr primarily computers, um, but we could also look for other things that we typically would buy from a state contract here. We can at least compare it and see what the cost difference is. If we join, these are automatically approved contractors from as far as the state is concerned? Um, I mean, we'd still have to confirm that they haven't been disbarred in our state, um, but in terms of the procurement process, they've all they've followed the procurement process that's needed. Yeah. Gentlemen. I move to authorize the district to execute an interlocal agreement with the Region 8 Education Service Center. It's been moved. This is your second. Second. It's been moved and second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, the motion as read, please signify by raising your hand aye. Carries uh, seven to zero. Thank you. Uh, okay. Look, uh, the calendar. Introduces? Sure. So uh, we talked about this last yep. uh, month, and since that month, the APEA surveyed their members, and at every school, they preferred the pre-Labor Day start, which is on your back page, which we sort of suspected last time. Um, the change that Mr. Donez suggested in the month of April, um, you could see has changed. That was, uh, I got confirmation from the APA they were comfortable with that change. Otherwise, nothing else has changed from what you looked at last month, and there was a broad endorsement at every school in the district, um, all the schools in the district, around the pre-Labor Day calendar that looked like this, um, as opposed to the post-Labor Day start. Is there any, uh, any questions or discussion? We need to vote on this, right? Uh, any questions or discussions? Mr. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't recall. What was the change that Mr. Doing has made, for, suggested for April? 
See, isn't it the tenth? Was the seventeenth? It was so the the uh, half day I think was uh, the week the prior, eighth. the week of the eighth. And so I had suggested moving it to the following week because it can be incredibly disruptive for parents um, when they have a half day and then day off that oh, they have okay. to contend with in the same week. Any um, anyone have a motion they want to offer? I'm so like, oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. I was looking this direction. <laughs> I withdraw my hand. No. no. <laughs> I move to approve the 2019-2020 school year calendar. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Dublin. <laughs> any, any comments, debates, seeing none? All those in favor of approving the calendar, raise your hand aye. Carries again, seven to nothing. This is awesome. Uh, not that it needed my editorial approval on top of the vote. <laughs> Uh, location of meetings. Do you want to introduce the sure. topic? Um, so, um, a topic of conversation between Amherst Media and District has been whether the town hall building uh, in Amherst, which has been outfit with new technology, would be a venue to have our meetings in. I know. Uh, I'll finish, but I know Mr. Donis and I spoke today, and she had some feedback from Amherst Media that, you know, she could share. Um, but so uh, the other part of that is that we haven't been able to do live meetings because the cameras. I know our IS staff has been in touch with Amherst Media's IS staff. It's about $8,500 or so to replace the cameras, um, which we can do, but we wanted to at least have the conversation before we, we just felt like fiduci fiduciarily it was good to have this conversation before we expended funds on um, technology for this space. Mr. Marina? Are there other meetings that use this room? The, I mean, uh, that are uh, taped? Yeah. Oh, okay. I just uh, wanted to oh, be. They would use the cameras. Uh, the Amherst School Committee meetings are the only other ones that I'm aware of that are taped in this space. Are you suggesting that the Amherst School Committee meeting as well as this, move to town hall? I'm suggesting it's a conversation that the committees oh, yes, yes. might want to have. I'm not making a recommendation. No, I meant, yeah. Are you including them in the conversation? Not in this conversation, because that would be a violation <laughs> okay, of open meeting law. Okay. <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> like, we're following the law. Be clear about it. Uh, Anyway, sorry. Uh, does anyone have any thoughts on this on this topic? So, so basically, the gist of it would be that the regional school committee would be meeting in Amherst Town Hall. I like meeting at the school. It's schoolish. It seems appropriate for the townish, but I don't know. I mean, on the other hand, if it would be more accessible to more people, is that the issue? Like, through the live streaming, is that what the? I guess I'm not quite understanding the camera issue. So, I mean, we could place these cameras. There's a cost to it, but I think the advantage of the new space, my understanding, is that it has the technology is better. It allows multiple people to be projecting and see things. There's more individual screens. I know Mr. Demling and Mr. Donez may have more information specifically on that. Um, and the other piece, which Mr. Donez can speak more more, to, more than I can, is just the feedback I've heard from, you know, at least one employee of Amherst Media is just, since they're already set up there, there's an auto-record feature, there, there's some other pieces that might be different in that setting with the technology, even if we replace these cameras. Is it honest? Yeah, so I, uh, you know, from in my capacity as a chair for the Amherst School Committee, I had a conversation with the executive director of Amherst Media um, at the direction of the committee to find out yeah. what their thinking was. And, you know, they, they had made it very clear that this was not a request that came from Amherst Media. This is actually from the, the town of Amherst had suggested it. Um, and it was specifically around technology. And I think the benefit to Amherst Media is uh, both the technology, is new technology that will be in the town hall, um, that we don't have here. We've had continuing problems, even predating when the cameras failed completely. <laughs> um, there's been technological problems. I think even just accessibility of communication between Amherst Media staff, uh, you know, the interns often that are here working the cameras, um, but also the staff that are back in the Amherst Media headquarters. Um, and there's just been a lot of problems that they've had for several years now. So they see this as an opportunity to actually, you know, fix all of that and have uh, better accessibility. And also I think that the big consideration is 
There's a lot more people that are definitely um, watching these videos stream live on, you know, the online as opposed to uh, watching through the television, you know, through, through the uh, public access. Um, but there is still a subset of the community that is watching, you know, through public access TV, and so um, all of that would be benefited by the move to the new. That was my question. Yeah, you know, without hotel. incurring yeah. additional expense. Okay. Mm -hmm. It is 6.30 on a Tuesday, one of those nights, you can't possibly find a parking place in downtown Amherst? I don't know who feels qualified to answer that question since we're all here. <laughs> you're rambling? Because there are I, I nights. think midnight to midnight is what you're Well, at di it's dinner time. All the restaurants are at full speed. It's Tuesday. It's so, so, so I said, so a couple other issues just to consider at the regional level. So we are... We don't have all four towns represented here, but um, so the, the biggest issue I think for the non Amherst members is that it's the town of Amherst Town Hall, right? And the region is supposed to fairly represent all four towns, and so to have what is essentially a separate legal entity, the region, regional school schools, uh, at the seat of town government for one <coughs> of the member towns, presents at least the appearance that of not a conflict of interest, but but it looks it looks odd, perhaps, to some. I think that would be one one of the concerns that I think mostly the uh, the, the members from the non Amherst towns would want to weigh in on. Sullivan, as a member of a non Amherst town, <laughs> as long as the thirteen member town council was not sitting there with us online. Mr. Dumbling. The other thing I, I would add is so we had a similar discussion at the Amherst School Committee, and not to speak about the so. I, I was expressing a similar sentiment to you that um, I, f I feel like being in the school gives it a, a schooly vibe. It's yeah. cozy, and and we do we do sort of think about accessibility in terms of how comfortable people feel um, going to certain spaces. That being said, I had a, a meeting with another board um, a couple weeks ago, and I had a chance to walk in and see the the room, and um, I was I was surprised that at the how, how the space looked. I was expecting it to feel a lot more austere and disconnected, and, and it, it didn't. Um, so we haven't yet finished our discussion at the Amherst School Committee level, but um, but there was the the idea of, you know, of a possibly having a, a test meeting there to see to see how it went, and or, or holding some meetings there and some meetings here, but... Um, we haven't had those conversations. Yeah, we haven't had those conversations. Can I? Oh, it was just a quick, I mean, a quick observation. Yeah, as a, as a Pelham person, uh, I, I'm with Mr. Sullivan, I mean, it, it doesn't really matter it's just it's a space and if it's a more congenial and a better equipped space that's I'd be fine with that um, but yeah just in talking about the sort of having it in school the only thing that came to mind tonight is certainly you know often student groups come in and mm -hmm. to the extent that it just feels comforting or welcoming yeah, to them to be at their in their own space that would be the only consideration in terms of having it at a school or not that I, I would think it's an interesting it's an interesting thing to me to, to I haven't been in the, the finished space over a town hall so I don't know how it looks I do know um, that um, I can't. I just can't think of the number of people who mentioned to me how intimidated they feel um, coming to these meetings, and uh, and that's in this setting, where if they're a parent, they may already be familiar with the setting. Certainly, I'm sure they're yeah. familiar with the cafeteria and the you know the, the auditorium and stuff like that. And so this is a, a setting that already feels should feel hopefully more accepting and opening and comforting to them. And yet when they're coming to this space um, before us, they often feel, um, you know, really intimidated, really uncomfortable, um, really stressed out and nervous. And I don't like the idea of creating a, another space where people may feel even more that way. Um, but I'm, I'm open-minded on it. I really think, are, are the members of so we're, others of us, some of us, a subset of us, are members of the Amherst Committee. Are you all members of your town committees? Yes. I mean, that's okay, how, yeah. that's how it works, that's right. Works. I mean, that's not dumb, but I'm just sort of processing this through. Audra's not here. She's obviously a member of, of Leverett's committee. I would really love, um, and I could send the email out, um, or you could, but I'd be happy to, um, to all of you <laughs> to go talk to your town regular your town committees go back to your towns talk to the other members so like a member who might join i mean i'm not saying what will happen this coming spring but if any of you left there might be a member who's already sitting on a committee there 
who'd be joining us, you know, this coming spring. Um, and I, I really, it, it, I'm sort of echoing something Mr. Dumling said. For me personally, I'm saying this is in the role of chair, I feel massively uncomfortable picking, and also because I'm from Amherst, I guess, um, I feel massively uncomfortable moving the venue of our meetings to our town hall for you guys to schlep to and come visit, unless, and it doesn't have to be a vote, but I'm saying if you come back in January and say, no, 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 we've talked about it, and our committees don't, we're, then we don't care. The technology is better, we can either do it or we can do it on a trial run, then I think that's great. Um, but I, I would feel much more comfortable knowing that you've talked it through with some of your neighbors. I want to reinforce the symbolism of having a school committee meeting in a school. There are books here. There were students in this room five hours ago. It's a school committee. <laughs> it's not a town government. Five hours and in, in increasing. <laughs> as we talk. No, and by, and by, and by, I, 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 I feel comfortable coming to the building. It's like, would you relive your high school course load if the presentation had been done at town hall? I feel You'd comfortable come. here with Mr. Menino. <laughs> Solomon, you have your hand raised? No. Oh, you're just, you're, okay, you're just moving in your chair. Uh, okay, so let's just talk about this in January. Also, I'd like Audra to be here or at least yeah. be aware of the conversation. Uh, I, all our towns have to buy in on this if we do it. Uh, we have a gift, or at least, at least one gift. Does anyone like to be recognized? Is it on this? Move to accept the following gifts. Um, anonymous number 142 to support the Family Center gift drive for homeless students in the amount of $500. Uh, Amherst Tritons or Tritons? Tritons. Tritons, Tritons. Tritons Association <laughs> Incorporated, uh, number 5034 to support lane lines for swim team, a uh, total of $500, and that's for a grand total of $1,000. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion is read. Signify with your hand. It carries seven to zero. By the way, there's any comments on it, they can make them now, but I just wanted to. No. Okay. Well, keep it going. Uh, upcoming topics before we adjourn this meeting. Yes. Um, I was reminded recently that because of Amherst's change in town government, there is. Um, likely a required wording change to our regional agreement. Oh yeah, totally. Um, and therefore requires the approval of all four towns that will have to work through some sort of process. So at some point, it should be on the agenda. We'll throw it on the agenda next time. Anything else? Mr. Morris, Dr. Sure. Morris, do you have anything you want to share with us? Uh, school choice hearing, OPEB trust documents and law ad adoption, Budget guidance, we'll get back to that in January. Clearly we didn't have time tonight, so I'm glad we made that editorial choice. Um, uh, we'll come back to SETF, fee review, location of meetings. Is there a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Uh, moved, is there a second? Second. second. <laughs> Vote. <laughs> Carries seven to zero. Thank you, Amherst Media. <laughs>